doctor, for example, or, or just not get the visits you're used to having from neighbors. Think of what that feels like, and yet what do they do with that? What, where do they turn? Think about how parents deal with this incredible anxiety of not having a paycheck, and how they express that to their families, what it makes them feel. So all New Yorkers are dealing with these challenges. And we want to make sure there's help for everyone. I've talked yesterday about our kids, what they're going through. We want to make sure there's help for them. And we're going to focus on them a lot. But I don't think I even have to say, when you think about who's gone through the most in this few months, the most trauma, the most pain, the, the things that would dredge up the deepest, sharpest feelings that somehow have to be aired and addressed, well, that's so many of our healthcare workers and our first responders. And for some of them, and you've, you've heard the stories of places like Elmhurst Hospital, for some of them, the only parallel to what they've gone through is what soldiers go through in war. And there's a phrase, combat stress, and there's a field of combat mental health, because it's understood that soldiers go through so much. And a way to deal with any mental health reality is not to ignore it, but to take it head on. And the military understands that. I just met with some of the amazing officers from the US Army who are doing this crucial work, who have learned the lessons of what our soldiers go through in war and have understood what they need to address it. And they're going to be helping us. And you're going to hear about that in a moment from our First Lady. But that phrase, combat stress, that's a wartime term. And um, Sherlane and I know something about it because both our dads served in World War II and brought back a lot from that war. And I've spoken very openly about what my dad went through, uh, the scars he brought back, both physical and emotional, and how much it framed the rest of his life. But that phrase, combat stress, wasn't really known the same way back then, and the support wasn't there. But now our military does provide it in a, in a very powerful way. And I never thought we'd have to use this word in the middle of New York City civilian life, but in fact, it is the right word, and we do need the help of our military to make sense of this situation. Think about what our doctors, our nurses, our healthcare workers have gone through. Our EMTs, our paramedics, think about the people they've had to watch pass away before their very eyes. Think about the fact that they are surrounded by this virus and they're fighting it and they're walking toward the danger, but they also have to think about what it means for their own health and what it might mean for their family and what happens if they want to go home and see their family. So they're carrying that burden. I'm sure a lot of them sometimes feel alone, and we can't let that happen. We can't let them carry that burden alone. We have to be there for them. Now, the idea of providing access to mental health services has been a core notion for this administration for the last six years. That's why Thrive NYC exists, to break down the barriers and open up access to mental health. And that initiative was for all New Yorkers of all kinds, but we've also had specialized initiatives for our heroes because we've known they've dealt with challenges before. No one could have imagined this pandemic, but they were already dealing with challenges. And there's two programs I want to mention uh, that are particularly good examples at Health and Hospitals, the Helping Healers Heal program. And a lot of our healthcare workers are leaning on this right now. It's a 24-7 helpline for doctors, nurses, staff. Any health and hospital staff can call it, 646-815-4150. And the FDNY has had a counseling services unit. It's renowned. It's a gold standard for the whole nation. In fact, other cities have sought out the FDNY's guidance and how to set up a similar approach. A very poignant example and a painful one was after the Parkland shootings in Florida. Folks in Florida turned to the FDNY to know how to provide that ongoing support to first responders. 
And our paramedics and our EMTs have been right there at the front line of this crisis. They need that help. And so I want to make sure FDNY members know you can call 212-570-1693. So these initiatives are up and running, but we need something even more in this moment of crisis. And that's where our military come in. And what they have been doing these last weeks, the military has been helping us in so many ways. I want to thank all those who come in to help our, in our hospitals, the extraordinary contribution they've made to fighting back the coronavirus. Now, they're gonna play a crucial role in addressing the mental health challenges as well. Now, to tell you about this extraordinary partnership with the Department of Defense, with our armed forces, I'm gonna turn to the First Lady and I'm gonna say it this simply. She has devoted her time as First Lady to breaking down the stigma that stands in the way of people getting the mental health services they need. She's really helped this whole city to have the right open conversation about what's going on inside all of us and how we have to bring it out in the open and ask for help and how help needs to be there for everyone with no stigma, no barriers. In this pandemic, she's taking that same impulse, those same lessons, and working to make sure we reach more and more New Yorkers who are going through so much. I want to thank her for that, and particularly for the work she is doing to bring these extraordinary military professionals in to help us further. So now I'll turn to our First Lady, Shirlane McRae. Thank you, Bill, for your leadership and especially for your compassion. For weeks now, all our frontline healthcare workers, who I think of as our soldiers of grace and mercy, have been pushed to the limit. Inside our hospitals, we've had battlefield conditions with triage and fear in the hallways. But when the emergency field hospitals and morgues close, after the TV crews leave and the clapping stops, our soldiers, our healers, go home. And we have to wonder, how do these healers manage their stress after seeing so much death and suffering? Their emotional state is a crisis within a crisis, an urgent mental health emergency. And that's why we are working with the Department of Defense, which has brought together a joint force from the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army. They are experts in dealing with combat stress and have a unique insight into how to help those who provide care in this kind of setting. The Department of Defense will train a thousand behavioral health staff in helping healers heal, helping healers heal champions as trainers who will further train HNH, Greater New York Hospital Association, FDNY, and EMS staff. The Department of Defense will also conduct assessments sharing advanced decompression and wellness strategies for combat stress management. This work with the Department of Defense is a critical new piece of what we are doing for all of our essential frontline workers in New York City. So how will we provide more support for our healthcare workers? Well, these DOD trauma specialists will look at individual hospitals and also the entire system. You know, every, every hospital is different. They'll want to talk to frontline leadership to get a picture of the most pressing mental and emotional needs. And they'll add to the programs, training our team on combat stress. At first, they'll do small groups from FDNY, uh, health and hospitals, and, and private hospitals will also be trained. And next, we'll train a, more than 1,000 health and hospitals personnel and, and other staff. The Department of Defense will provide a whole new higher level of trauma care for those on the front line. Our heroes will have the opportunity to receive an individual assessment. And all of this work is already underway. We're ramping up to be fully operational in May with the program fully in place by June. This is not the time, nor is it appropriate, for us to hide the level of, express, of stress that is experienced by our nurses and doctors and medical 
medical te technicians. We have to face this head on. This is not something that, that um, we should be secretive about. And I have to say that once again, New York City is a leader in this effort. No other city has a comprehensive mental health program for health care workers at this scale. And, and it will not be a one-off. This program, with the trainers and other resources, will be incorporated into our health care facilities so that even long after this pandemic is over, our health care workers will have these services. I want to thank the U.S. military, h and &H, Office of Emergency Management, and the New York Fire Department. The service of our frontline healthcare workers is beyond what anyone could have rightfully asked. They have inspired a city and a nation, but it comes at a steep price. In recent days, we've lost John Mondello, an EMT working in the Bronx, and Dr. Lana M. Breen, an ER medical director at Presbyterian. Please join me for a moment of silence in their memories. We owe these workers the world that we will enjoy after this virus is defeated. And we will not forget them. We will not forget this debt. When people ask our hospital workers, what did you do during the great pandemic of 2020? We want them to say, with pride, I showed up. I did my best. I saved lives because my community supported me. I was able to take care of myself while taking care of others. And I stayed healthy in mind, body, and spirit. Thank you, Shalane. That's a beautiful sentiment, and it's exactly the spirit we have to bring to everything we do to support our heroes and this incredible initiative with the U.S. military is going to help us do it. And remember, every single one of you, every time you say thank you to a healthcare worker or a first responder, every time you applaud them, every time you ask them if they're doing okay, if there's anything they need, that helps so much. But what our military is going to do is going to be outstanding because we've seen they bring a special ability and their presence, as I said, in our hospitals not only their skills, but that extraordinary confidence it gives everyone to see them present has been really, really crucial to getting through this crisis. So, so thankful to everyone who's brought together this new initiative to address the combat stress. That's the reality for so many here. Now, there's another important new approach we're going to take to protect our heroes. And it is to give them more information about what they've experienced during this pandemic. I want to talk to you about testing. And what we've talked about before is the coronavirus test. It's called the PCR test. And that is the test that answers the most immediate question at this exact moment. Are you infected with the coronavirus? That's the test that is crucial to so much of what we're going to do going forward. That's the test I wish we had had a lot more of when we needed it earlier on. But there's another test that really will provide a lot of help and support as well. And that's the antibody testing. And I'm going to talk to you about a new initiative that will reach so many of our healthcare workers and first responders. And I'm going to tell you why this is so important and the, the sweep of what we're going to do here. I'm also going to give a few qualifications because it's important to recognize what we know and what we don't know when it comes to antibody testing. But here is what we do understand that a particularly good antibody test, there's many different kinds, but the ones that are most accurate and effective give you a clear indication 
of whether you have been infected by the coronavirus previously. And they give you some real confidence because here's what we can say. Anyone who has been infected and came through obviously had the ability to beat this disease. Knowing if you've been exposed to it is powerful information. Our healthcare workers and our first responders who are dealing with folks who might be infected, it is going to give them additional confidence to know if they've been previously exposed. Think about what it takes every day to get up and say, I'm going to go where the COVID-19 is, where I know it is. The folks who go into the hospitals, the emergency rooms, the ICUs, the paramedics, the EMTs, all the folks who know they're going to where the danger is, they're, of course, thinking of their families, their own families, too. So having a sense of whether you've been exposed previously is very important. And giving the best answer we can brings a lot of value. On top of that, we are seeing really impressive results with treatments based on plasma that needs to come from those who have already been exposed. So there's a growing hope that when you identify people who have been exposed, you're identifying folks who can then give blood that then allows for the treatment of more people who are sick and help save lives. And we know one thing about our healthcare workers and our first responders, they are doing this work because they care so much about saving lives and helping other people. So knowing that they could be amongst those who give blood that saves other lives is entirely consistent with everything they've devoted their lives to. And then there's the fact that we're going to get information that can help us fight this disease. We all understand the entire global medical community is still trying to understand the coronavirus, figure out the best ways to fight back. One day there will be a vaccine. One day there will be a cure. But the more information we gather, the more likelihood we get to that day sooner. So antibody testing brings a lot to the table. And our goal is to reach a lot of people who would like to take advantage of it on a voluntary basis, of course. But I'm talking about our healthcare workers. I'm talking about our police officers, our firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, correction officers, so many who would like to have this opportunity. And now it will be provided for all who want it. So thinking about our healthcare workers, thinking about our first responders, we are initiating a plan to reach 150,000 of our heroes and give them this antibody testing, to give them that knowledge, and that peace of mind, and to ensure that they are also helping us take the next step in fighting this disease. We have agreed to a partnership with the federal government, with the Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Disease Control. And more details will be announced in the next few days. But the plan is to begin as early as next week to offer the tests in hospitals, at firehouses, at police precincts, uh, at correction facilities, wherever our healthcare workers and our first responders are to make the tests readily available. Again, this will be provided for free. The federal government is covering the cost and it will be provided to all who want to take advantage of this test. Now, I mentioned that I'm going to say the antibody test. Um, no one is claiming it is perfect. It does not tell you the best of I understand from all of our healthcare leadership and from listening to Dr. Fauci and others, it does not tell you if you're entirely immune in the sense we all think of that word. When we hear the word immune, we think you just can't possibly get something again. There is not yet confidence uh, that having been exposed to the coronavirus once means you can never get it again. Now, common sense tells us if you were exposed once and you made it through, you're in very good stead. You're in a very good situation to make it through again if you ever were exposed again. But we don't know for sure if anyone can contract this disease a second time. The good news is, honestly, there's not a lot of evidence that people have, but we don't know for sure. So that's a limitation that we have to be clear about. And 
It's also important that even folks who get a positive result do not think that means that they can let down their guard. Now, I'm not saying people would think they're invincible, but they have to be really clear that there still are dangers because we're dealing with an unknown disease. We're dealing with so many questions. So for healthcare workers and first responders, they would still continue in their work to wear the PPEs just as they were previously. And we still need to practice the same concepts, the social distancing, and we still be, have to be watchful for symptoms even if someone has tested positive. But again, it's not a perfect test, but it does give real information. It is helpful. It tells you something very important, and it's part of solving this bigger puzzle of the coronavirus and fighting it back. So this, again, more details to be announced, but a wonderful step forward and a huge initiative. The goal is to reach 150,000 of our heroes. Now, let me talk about another effort to protect people. And this is now about how we protect some of the very most vulnerable in New York City, homeless New Yorkers. Again, the compassion I talked about earlier, New Yorkers feel tremendous compassion for folks whose lives in some way came unraveled and they ended up on the street or they ended up in shelter. So a few weeks ago I told you we had a goal of having 6,000 homeless in hotels rather than congregate shelters to make sure that people were safe. And that goal has been reached. And now we are going to go farther. This week we will move an additional 1,000 homeless individuals from congregate shelters to hotel facilities. The priority will be on folks in those larger congregate shelters that are having more trouble with this uh, social distancing. And there's going to be a constant effort to evaluate all shelters and wherever there are social distancing problems, continue to take people out of the shelters into hotels. Thousand this week. We are prepared to do a thousand more each week going forward. Reasons for people to be in shelters who need the services in shelters. So for some people, it actually can be much, much better to stay in the shelter setting. But we've got to make sure there's enough space. We've got to make sure that we strike that balance. We're also going to provide additional medical oversight. Uh, our health and hospitals team is going to work with Department of Homeless Services to bring additional medical oversight to all uh, homeless services sites. The goal is to constantly be vigilant for anything that might pose a danger to homeless New Yorkers. And starting this week, we will begin a program of testing homeless individuals at uh, homeless services sites. Uh, of course, anyone who tests positive will be isolated. This uh, initiative will begin uh, this week and expand over the next couple of weeks. The goal is to reach across the entire shelter system by the middle of May. All right, a few more things before we turn to our colleagues in the media. And we've talked about some, some serious and somber topics, but now let's turn to something I think people are going to be happy to hear about. And, you know, look, when our lives changed so profoundly over the last weeks, it's almost been impossible to take stock of all the things that are different and the things we miss and the things we need that we can't have right now. And some of those things are going to take a while longer, but there are other things that we can start to bring back if only online for now, later in person. But there's some things that we need to make available to people online that could really change their lives for the better. And we know there are a lot of folks in the weeks leading up to this crisis who were planning on doing something absolutely beautiful. They were planning on getting married. And uh, Shirley and I are coming up on our anniversary on May 14th, 26 years. And um, we know what a beautiful reality marriage is, what it means to people, how it frames their whole lives, and yet Folks haven't been able to get married in these last weeks. So the good news is we're going to have a very, very good new visitor in our city. Cupid is coming to New York City. Project Cupid 
will allow couples to get married online. And this will start later on next week, and it'll be available in 11 different languages. And this is a great team effort. We want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson of the City Council. We want to thank the City Clerk's Office and our colleagues at Do It, our Information Technology Department, who all put their minds together in a spirit of love and said, how do we figure this out? How do we get back in the marriage business and help people who are ready to tie the knot do so online? So again, not this week, but late next week, this will start up and information will be available at nyc.gov slash cupid. And I want you to know, this is such a great example of New Yorkers saying, you know what, even in the face of a pandemic, we're not going to let it change us and we're not going to let a pandemic stand in the way of love. We're going to let people get married and go forward with their lives and look to the better days ahead. Okay. Let's now talk about what we talk about every single day, which is the daily indicators. So as I go into them, I can say we've had a good day, not a perfect day, but a good day. Uh, and we got to keep pushing and we got to keep doing better. So the first indicator, unfortunately, is up. The daily number of people admitted to hospitals for suspected COVID-19 went up from 112 to 136. But the other indicator is going in the right direction. Daily number of people in ICUs and our public hospitals for suspected COVID-19 down from 745 to 734. Percentage of people testing positive for COVID-19 citywide down from 27% to 23%. Public health lab tests down from 56% to 29%. That's great. So progress, like most days we've seen progress, but not what we still need fully to get everything going down in the same direction now. We're going to talk, I am certain, about the challenges of maintaining social distance. And I can tell you, we have to stick to it. And yes, we're about to have warmer weather. And yes, everyone's going a little stir crazy, but we have to stick to it because every time you see these indicators go in the right direction, that's because of the work you've been doing. But if we loosen up, these indicators will start to go in the wrong direction. Now, unless there's someone out there that wants to delay the restart, uh, and wants to see this horrible crisis continue, I think we can all agree we got to buckle down and beat this disease. And every time you're socially distanced, every time you stay home, you're helping to fight back the disease and save lives. we got to stick with it. I'll just close before saying a few words in Spanish, and then we'll open to our colleagues in the media that, you know, we're going to be spending a long time trying to figure out everything that happened here in terms of the human impact over these last months and certainly the months ahead. And the mental health piece of this is in some ways probably going to be the hardest to make sense of. As we always say, it's different than the, the physical reality or the physical scars. The mental scars take longer to uncover and, and process and make sense of. But so many people are dealing with these challenges in one way or another. The bottom line, as you heard from the announcement today, whether you're one of our heroes, whether you're an everyday New Yorker practicing social distancing, whether you're a parent trying to support your kids, whoever you are, you're not alone. And we're going to be there for you. And 24 hours a day, seven days a week, multiple languages, and for free, anyone who needs help can call 888-NYC-WELL and get a trained counselor and get that support. Lots of people are doing that, and it's helping them through. I want to invite anyone who needs that help to take advantage of it. A few words in Spanish. Esta pandemia ha resultado en una crisis dentro de una crisis, ya que afecta a la salud mental de tantos neoyorquinos a nuestros trabajadores de salud y de emergencia les afecta mucho. Y necesitamos ayudar a todos los héroes que nos ayudan. A nuestros héroes les vamos a dar el apoyo que necesitan para llevar este cargo para que vuelvan más fuertes 
que nunca. With that, we will turn to our colleagues in the media. And again, always remember to give me the name and the outlet of each journalist. Hi, all. Just a reminder that we have First Lady McRae and Police Commissioner Shea here in person. And on the phone, we have Fire Commissioner Nigro, Health Commissioner Barbeau, Social Services Commissioner Banks, and Vice President and Chief Quality Officer for NYC Health and Hospitals, Dr. Wei. With that, I will start with Ashley from the New York Times. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and everyone on the phone. Um, I wanted to ask a two-part question. One, um, there was some suggestion by the shul that this that the funeral in Brooklyn last that was broken up last night had been coordinated with the police somehow. Um, I'm wondering, Mr. Mayor, if you could tell us if you were aware of those plans. And then uh, for Commissioner Shea, um, can you tell us in detail about any contact that or plans that the NYPD may have made with uh, pertaining to this individual's funeral? And also answer, uh, you know, are there others planned and how do you plan to deal with this in the future if there are other deaths in the, in the Orthodox community? Ashley, I'll start and I'll turn to the commissioner. Um, I heard about this situation. Um, I believe it was somewhere around the 6.30 to 7 o'clock. Uh, I was very concerned when I heard there might be a large gathering. Um, the commissioner will talk about uh, how the NYPD approached it. But I have to say, um, again, I understand that when people are going through mourning, they're in real pain. But we have to understand what it means to hold a large gathering in New York City today. It, it means, unfortunately, that people who go to that gathering, some will be sick with this disease. It's just a fact. We know this. Some will spread the disease to others. People, as a result, will die. So I have a long, deep relationship with the Orthodox Jewish community. A lot of personal relationships. A lot of people I know and respect. I have a lot of love for the community. The notion that people would gather in large numbers, and even if they didn't mean to, would spread a disease that will kill other members of the community is just unacceptable to me. So we have to do something different. And um, we have to break out of whatever we thought was normal in the past because these are not normal times. So we're not going to be allowing these kind of gatherings in any community. Uh, this was by far the largest, community, the largest gathering in any community of New York City of any kind that I had heard of or seen uh, directly or on video since the beginning of this crisis, and it's just not allowable. So we have to change this reality. We will work closely with the community to do it, but we have to change this reality. Commissioner? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think you hit the nail on the head. Before we get into the specifics of yesterday's incident, what troubles me most is, um, as a department, as a city, we've been through a lot already. And members that have gotten sick, members that have given their life, whether it's in the health field, certainly in the police department. Make no mistake, this large gathering such as this is putting members of my department at risk. And it cannot happen. And it will not happen. And it's going to be met with very stern, as it was last night, immediately being broken up and, and stern consequences. What we know about yesterday's incident was at approximately 3.30 in the afternoon, we learned of the passing, unfortunately, of, of a prominent rabbi from the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn. Um, immediately, within, within minutes, uh, members of the local precinct were in contact with clergy liaisons and, and members of the uh, Jewish community in terms of what to expect at that location. Um, plans were put in place. A detail was put in place. Unfortunately, when you look back at some of the past incidents, there's been a lot of work done throughout New York City with every faith. And people, again, have been overly, uh, overwhelmingly compliant. Um, but there has been a couple incidents that, that were not so. Uh, so contingency plans were put into place. A number of officers were detailed uh, in, the, in the unlikely event that large numbers came, and we thought that that was a possibility, but absolutely, I think we've been pretty consistent, Mr. Mayor, for what seems like a longer time, but probably months now, that there are to be no gatherings 
in New York City, such as what we saw last night. So within, uh, a, a, as the time unfolded last night, there was probably several thousand people uh, that, that came in and around that location on Bedford Avenue. Uh, additional officers, I was in conversations with uh, members of the um, upper echelon of the NYPD. Additional officers were called in, and in pretty short time, um, that crowd was dispersed, and, and a number, I think the final tally I saw was 12 summonses were issued for a variety of offenses, um, certainly social distancing, and then including some for a refusal to disperse. But I, I want to end where, where I started with this. What happened last night simply cannot happen. And, and we need all New Yorkers, all New Yorkers have come together during this crisis, but they need to do it more than ever. And we need community leaders to stand beside us. Uh, we cannot have people unnecessarily being exposed to a disease that is having catastrophic effects on our membership and, and really New Yorkers as a whole. Next we have Henry from Bloomberg. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, good morning. Uh, my question has to do with how you are going to assess the different levels of risk involved in human activity. For example, why can't people play tennis? Why can't you regulate the amount of people who will be visiting or who could visit city pools when it's 98 degrees in the summer, or regulate the traffic going into city beaches and give people maybe a ticket or a rain check uh, for another date if they can't go to the pool that day and regulate the time period and the amount of use at that pool. Because we're facing what happened last night is almost like a release of a valve. There's going to be a level of frustration in this city that will be very difficult, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but it'll be very difficult to manage the, uh, the expectations and the needs of this population. I, I mean, am I wrong? What is your response to my question? Well, Henry, I think you said a couple of different things. Um, I think the issues you raised obviously are being felt all over New York City. But again, I want to say a large gathering, this is a different issue. When you talk about pools or beaches or tennis, you're talking about what individuals do. This, this, um, what we saw last night was absolutely unacceptable. It would be unacceptable in any and all communities. It was a large gathering, again, tragically, thousands of people. The amount of danger created by that kind of gathering is inestimable. The fact that people will die because of it, which goes against everyone's values. Um, I want to separate that kind of thing from the question you're asking, which I think is a fair and important question about what can we do for everyday people, individual people from all parts of our community as we try to, over time, work our way back to normal. So what I'd say is the first rule is there will be no large gatherings of any kind anywhere. And anyone who equates uh, a small number of people around you know, uh, a blanket in a park with what we saw last night is entirely missing the point. We are talking about thousands of people in close proximity in one site. We will never, ever allow something like that to go unchecked anywhere. Now, if you say, OK, people are understandably yearning to get outside and the weather's going to get warm. We're working on this all the time. And we're going to have uh, announcements on this soon, how we're going to address the warm weather. We've worked with the city council on one piece of it, which is to try and open up more space in certain key areas with enforcement. But when you talk about pools, beaches, tennis courts, each thing's going to be looked at individually. There's the whole different piece of the equation which we've talked about, which is what can we afford to open? And that's going to be all about what happens with the stimulus in Washington and whether we even have money to open some of these things. And that's a big question mark right now. 
But then beyond is the question of what will keep people safe, the most important question. What will protect people's health and safety? And places where a lot of people might congregate create a real danger. We have to know we can manage them properly and there can be proper enforcement and that the time is right. So the indicators will tell us when we can start opening up and we're going to do it very carefully, methodically. And each thing you mentioned will be looked at in turn when the time is right, but only when the time is right. Next, we have Marsha from CBS. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing today? Good morning, Marsha. How are you? Um, I need to ask you about what happened in Williamsburg, because a number of leaders in the Jewish community are quite upset that the members of that community were singled out when there's been violations of social distancing in many places. Number one, they're asking for an apology. And number two, they're inferring that the fact that you're singling out a Jewish community could add to the ins number of anti-Semitic incidents that happen in the city. So I'm wondering if you will apologize if you feel bad about singling them out. Also related to social distancing, wondering if the NYPD will repurpose some staff like crossing guards who are not being used to help with social distancing. And on an unrelated topic about medical examiners, are you thinking about the possibility of directing the medical examiners to extend the hours on weekdays, maybe to midnight, and possibly staying open on weekends? Okay. Um Marsha, respect all those questions. Our team will follow up with you on the medical examiner because, again, I'm asking everyone in the interest of fairness, all your colleagues have been doing two questions up front, one or two, and we're going to stick to that rule. So I will speak to your question, and the commissioner can speak to the crossing guard question. Um, I spoke last night out of passion. I could not believe my eyes, Marsha. It was deeply, deeply distressing. Again, this is a community I love. This is a community I have spent a lot of time working with closely. And if you saw anger and frustration, you're right. I spoke out of real distress that people's lives were in danger before my eyes, and I was not going to tolerate it. So I regret if the way I said it in any way gave people uh, a feeling of being treated the wrong way. That was not my intention. It was said with love, but it was tough love. It was anger and frustration. And what I saw, no, Marsha, it's not happened other places. Let's be honest. This kind of gathering has happened in only a few places. And it cannot continue. It's endangering the lives of people in the community. So to all those, and I understand politicians, everyone has said, oh, look, you know, this is like people gathering in the park. No, it's not like people gathering in the park. It was thousands of people. Can we just have an honest conversation here? It was not acceptable. We will not tolerate it. I also will not tolerate any anti-Semitism, ever. And for decades, I've made it my business to stand up for the Jewish community, and people know that. Won't tolerate anti-Semitism won't allow it to grow in the city. We fought it back many times. My message was to all communities, and that was written in black and white. But it was also to be clear that what I saw, I had not seen anywhere else. And I was trying to be honest about the fact that there's a problem that people have to come to grips with and deal with, or else people in the community will die. And that's not something to get somehow shunted aside. I understand the power of words, obviously. But I'm not going to let that power, that concern about words, overcome the value of human life. We're here to protect human beings. And people were put in danger last night. Members of the Jewish community were putting each other in danger. They were putting our police officers in danger. Now, if I see it in any other community, I'll call that out equally. So again, if in my passion and in my emotion I said something that in any way was hurtful, I'm sorry about that. That was not my intention. But I also want to be clear, I have no regrets about calling out this danger and saying we're going to deal with it very, very aggressively. Commissioner, do you want to speak to the crossing guard issue? Sure. And if I may, I mean, just to echo uh, the mayor's comments on last night, there were thousands of people crammed onto one block. Um, and, and when you look at everything that we are going through as a city, we live in an imperfect world, and we 
you know, my department certainly, I, I have seen instances of not social distancing. But I could tell you, Marsha, that you, as you know, there was two funerals last weekend for members of the NYPD. We would normally have probably tens of thousands of people at that funeral. We, we had a handful. People have to be accountable for their own actions, regardless of what neighborhood, ethnicity, where they come from. We cannot have what we had last night. We will not tolerate it. We are going to break it up immediately. And really, you cannot even go to that event. That's what it comes down to. Regarding the crossing guards, um, you know, we've been hit hard throughout the department. We have really positive news. We still are praying for a number of uh, members that are in the hospitals, but we're on the road back, uh, thank God, in terms of our sick rates. Uh, one of the things that we are still watching closely is who is at work, who is essential across many titles. And when we look at crossing guards, I think it's well known. You, you, you tend to have people that are a little bit older. Um, so we are very cautious of how we use those crossing guards, in what capacity, and people um, in terms of their age, prior medical conditions, and the situations we put them in. Of course, we're looking at any and all employees of the NYPD, how to get the most out of uh, what we use. We've, we've worked with other city agencies in terms of lending some of our expertise to other city agencies, and we would not be against uh, continuing to do that. But we're also going to do it uh, uh, in a smart manner that really watches out for everyone's safety. Next, we have Katie from the Wall Street Journal. Hey, good morning, everyone. I wanted to follow up with the, with the questions of many of my colleagues. The one thing that I can get some clarity from the commissioner on is, you know, the NYPD's involvement with the organization of last night's funeral. Um, so former city councilman David Greenfield said, I guess, that this was a lot. He, he, you know, he tweeted, I guess, he had some information that, you know, this was organized with the NYPD's um, uh, approval. I don't know if they knew that if you, if your department knew there would be so many people who showed up, but um, questions on that and more details on that. When these summonses were issued, was it after the mayor came and, and asked for it to be broken up or did it happen before? Um, and just for the mayor, you know, there have been multiple reports. Uh, the, the governor has cited these reports of funerals, and I even drove by a large funeral once on the BQE a few weeks ago. So why were you so shocked that this was the case? Because it seems to have been a consistent problem. Now, Katie, I'll start and pass to the commissioner. Uh, again, uh, respectfully, uh, I'm not, you're, you're saying I was shocked this was the case. That's not what I'm saying. I've been talking about this issue previously that we won't tolerate. I even said we wouldn't tolerate. Again, I really want you guys to um, take the fact that we constantly are briefing you and respect that we're trying to give you a lot of information and you're all intelligent people. You've heard in great detail telling people they cannot gather from all religious communities in their houses of worship. That's been going on for weeks. Telling people they can't even do services in a living room because that's going to endanger lives. We've been talking about all of these dangers and the fact that we're not going to tolerate them and we are going to enforce. And we've talked about funerals before as well. That's why I'm so angry that we have given plenty of warnings worked with community leaders to ensure they gave the warnings, and they have, by the way, overwhelmingly. Let me make sure this is crystal clear. I've said it many times, but I know there are many in this town who love to create confusion and division, so let me try one more time. I want to thank the Jewish community leadership. I want to thank the rabbinical leadership who have consistently said people should not gather for religious services or anything else because it will endanger their own community. I have seen total unity, and I appreciate that unity. And so it's up to everyone in every community to respect these voices of their city government, of the leaders of their communities. There have been clarity across the board. What is so frustrating to me is after all those messages were so clear that so many people would still choose to gather. I understand that they lost someone very dear and important to them, but this is still a pandemic. People's lives are put in danger when people gather. So what's shocking to me is that after all the warnings, something of this size would happen. And that's where I'm making very clear, unapologetically, 
that the next gathering will be met by summonses and arrests, period. No more warnings. And that's true in every community. Equal opportunity in New York City. If you gather, I'm not talking again about a few friends hang out in the corner. I'm saying if you have a large gathering, hundreds of people, thousands of people, they're not even going to have a discussion. It's just we're going immediately to summons, and if we have to use arrest, we'll use arrest. Go ahead, Commissioner. Yeah, Katie, and uh, I, I think I touched on it before. Um, we've been in, in constant contact with uh, leaders of different communities throughout New York City of different faiths. Uh, just last week, uh, I could tell you, um, members of the Muslim community, members of the Jewish community, um, I, I spoke to the Cardinal uh, just this week. Uh, this, is, this is what we do, and in terms of social distancing, probably not a day goes by that myself and the mayor don't talk about whether it's social distancing in parks, whether it's the sick rate of our employees, whether it's testing that came up earlier today, mental health uh, yesterday, we, and, and certainly um, funerals and, and uh, religious events comes up. Uh, I, I, I don't know of anyone in New York City that doesn't know what's going on two months into this. I think from, from the mayor's executive orders, from the governor's executive orders, from watching the news every night, um, everyone knows what is uh, acceptable and what is not. And conversations between members of the NYPD and, and leaders, who, by the way, members of the Jewish community, extremely helpful in, in, in uh, navigating circumstances with this over the last two months, because there have been a couple incidents. Um, but uh, planning for what shouldn't happen uh, is in no way um, uh, having a conversation regarding, you should not equate that with having a conversation regarding condoning a particular event. That event last night never should have happened. It better not happen again. It can't. It is, again, we can talk about this till the cows come home. It doesn't get any crystal clearer than this for me. You are putting my cops' lives at risk, and it's unacceptable. Next, we have Julia from The Post. Hi, good morning to everyone. Um, I have two questions, uh, one for you, Mr. Mayor, and one for Ms. McCray. Um, for you, you addressed the um, homeless and the shelters, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your plan for the homeless and the subways. I see that um, the MTA worked with the NYPD last night to get some people off the trains but it seems unsustainable to do that night after night. So what's the long-term plan? Um, and then for Ms. McCray, I'm wondering if she can just list her specific credentials for co-chairing the Racial Inequity Task Force and the Mental Health Program for Frontline Workers, given that critics, including Councilman Reynoso, has called the first appointment cronyism and nepotism. Well, let me... Uh speak to the homeless issue, and then I'd like to preface uh, on the question of the uh, commission, since I'm the person who decided how to approach that, uh, that internal task force, I should say. And I'll certainly turn to Sherlane then. On the homeless, I had a conversation yesterday uh, with uh, Sarah Feinberg of the MTA to emphasize that we are ready immediately to implement a plan in those 10 uh, terminus stations that I talked to you about in detail yesterday. And this is something Commissioner Shea and Commissioner Banks and others, we all gathered together to discuss and have real faith this would be a game changer. But to be a game changer, we have to disrupt business as usual, which means we have to close those stations in the late night hours, 12 midnight to 5 a.m. Replace the service with a shuttle bus for anyone who needs to get on that line uh, outbound, and they'll still be able to use it just like you use a shuttle bus when there's maintenance or anything else. So it won't disrupt service for people who need service, but allow for deep cleaning of the stations, and will allow for the NYPD and our outreach workers to engage people in a much more effective manner. And it will change the pattern that uh, Julia has existed for decades in this city, where a homeless individual could ride a subway line back and forth and back and forth. And that's something that's just not right. Uh, we need to address that. Um, 
What we are seeing here is a real problem, but it's not because something fundamentally changed compared to all the previous decades. It's that there are very few people riding the subways. There are much, there's much less service. And so the homeless individuals who have been there all along are obviously standing out more, but it's also a clarion call to help them, uh, to do more to get them out of the subways, off the streets, into long-term shelter, into affordable housing. And I feel for all the riders who are distressed. It's painful to watch. It's unpleasant to watch. It's unsettling to watch. We don't want anyone to go through it. But this city's been dealing with this issue for decades. We've got to do things differently. That's why we came up with the journey home approach. That's why we came up with Homestat. And these things are working. But this is a new approach. NYPD feels strongly this is the X factor to end that habit of, of an individual just being able to stay on that train or maybe only get off briefly to get right back on and go the whole other way on the line. We're not, we're kidding ourselves if we think we can get um, a different result by doing the same thing over and over again for years and years and years. So I talked to Sarah Feinberg. I said, we're ready to do this. We're ready to cover the cost. Um, all we need is the NPA support. We had a good conversation. We're waiting for an answer and we could get going immediately. And in terms of sustainability, this is a sustainable plan for sure. The Homestead Initiative has brought thousands of homeless folks off the street permanently. The Journey Home Initiative will transform the reality of homelessness on the streets of the city. I don't have a doubt in my mind. And if we can get the support of the MTA, we'll put in all the people power, we'll pay the cost to get homeless folks out of the subway in a whole new way. It won't be perfect, but it will be a game changer. It's absolutely sustainable, but we need the MTA to say yes, so please. Ask the MTA today if they will support this plan, allow us to pay for it and get going with it so we can really change the reality for not only the homeless, but for all the strap hangers who suffer with this problem. To the question of the internal task force on equity and inclusion. We have a disparity crisis in the city. We had it before it's been made sharper and in some ways even worse by this disease. My goal with the internal task force, which came out of a variety of conversations among members of this administration, was to ensure that all city agencies maximally address disparity. There's been great work over the last six years. There's more that can and should be done. To ensure that happens, it was crucial to make sure uh, that the leaders of this task force would be the people who had the strongest understanding of the issue and the greatest vision about how to address the problem and carried the weight to ensure that all city agencies would follow through on the work of the task force. Um, your idea, with all due respect, Julia, of what is a qualification, well, you have the right to your opinion. I'll tell you what a qualification is. A qualification, in my view, is who has the weight and the gravitas, who has the intellect, who has the vision, who has the standing in this administration, because this is an internal task force. Well, this whole administration was created, and we talked about it long before you happened to be a reporter here, the way we did our transition, the way we chose our team, the way we've continued to build our team. The person who's been the architect with me has been our first lady. And I've said many times, she's my closest advisor and my partner in everything I do. So who better to co-chair an internal task force to make sure that the government is addressing these issues than her? Deputy Mayor Thompson has devoted his entire life to issues of inclusion and equity. And I also am announcing that we're adding a third co-chair, Deputy Mayor Raul Perea Hense, uh, who brings a wealth of experience and obviously uh, has expertise in some of the issues and agencies reporting to him in some of the areas where there's been greatest concern about disparity. But uh, I'll turn to Sherlane and forgive my long intro by saying I know who will get the job done and she will get the job done. Sherlane. Julia, I would remind you that the primary task of this uh, body is to listen, to gather information, and to make recommendations. It is not a decision-making body. It is a position that requires the ability to, to listen well, to convene, and be able to gather information. 
Uh, I'm a volunteer. I'm certainly well placed within this administration to, to take on this work. And I have a, a, a very um, committed approach to, to this work. I've been a mental health champion from the beginning of this administration. Um, and I have uh, been praised by leaders of national organizations around the country. Uh, I think that if you want to know more about my qualifications, that you should talk to my team and we will let you know all of the things that I have done that would merit such a position and more. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Anna from the Daily News. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two questions. One, given the budgetary issues that the city is facing, are you guys going to move forward with the BQX uh, project? And also, I'm just curious if the First Lady is going to have to give you a haircut at some point. You're looking a little... Um, your hair's looking a little long these days, so I'm just curious if that's in, in your future. I want to give Anna credit. You're, you know, we knew this day would come where a journalist would ask the question. Uh, yes, this has been a topic at home, and uh, Shirlane is a long... Uh, Anna, you may have seen some of my pictures from my younger years when I first met Shirlane, and my hair was at least as long as this, and so she's a fan of the longer hair, but yes, it's getting a little, a little much. So we're gonna have to figure out a new approach to hair management. Uh, the longer hair's day, I think, is, is uh, coming to an end. But uh, on the question, a uh, very good and important question about the budget, um, you know, something like the BQX, which we were, had just begun, um, a whole phase of environmental impact review. Um, it's going to be looked at now with all the other major uh, capital initiatives. We talked yesterday about some things that have been absolutely essential, like the affordable housing program, which is being, you know, some pieces of it are being delayed because of the reality of this crisis and our budget reality. So we're certainly going to look at the BQX and make decisions thinking about those same realities. I don't want to give you a firm answer Today, it will be discussed in the budget process and be part of what we say around the budget in June. But it's a very good example of the kind of thing that now has to be thought of very differently, simply uh, for the budget ramifications alone. Now, that was going to be obviously an initiative that could only work with a very substantial federal funding. But to the extent there was any uh, city exposure, it has to be considered now as part of our budget process. Next, we have Steve from Westwood One News. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks again for taking our questions every day and giving us uh, ample opportunity uh, to get responses from you. We really appreciate this. Um, quick question about uh, a major recreation space uh, in Southern Brooklyn. Um, the Gateway National Recreation Area has been a really important release valve for people in Brooklyn and Queens who want to get outside who want to be out there recreating with their families while maintaining significant social distancing and not having to worry about being close to others. But the MTA has decided to park idle buses because they're using fewer buses at uh, the Floyd Bennett Field facility. And as a result, uh, the entire facility, which had been used for weeks now for safe recreation, is now closed to the public. It's also cut off 400 people from their community gardens at a time when many New Yorkers are having trouble putting food on their tables and, and those 400 people rely on the food that they're growing in those community gardens to feed themselves. I'm just wondering, it seems like the MTA and the Parks Department uh, reached this agreement without uh, knowledge of City Hall. I'm wondering if that's the case and uh, if there's anything being done to try to find an alternative such as uh, the Reese Beach parking lot, which is uh, completely unused right now or any other facilities to park these buses. And then one other question about the beaches. Um, considering that uh, we have people social distancing in. Steve, you there? Steve? Well, we got, we got part one, I guess. If we can get them back, we can do the second part. I'll start answering, and you'll let me know if you, if you bring them back. Um, uh, Steve, uh, thank you uh, for your comment. In the beginning, I want to say I think uh, for everyone, uh, 
Is Steve back or not? I'm hearing some feedback there. You good? Steve? Yeah. Okay, there you go. You, we heard you start to talk about beaches and then lost you. I think we're second qu uh, As a second question, uh, the, the beach issue was just, you know, it seems like social distancing as it's maintained in Central Park and Prospect Park could also be maintained on many of our 14 miles of city beaches over the summer. Some of them may perhaps not. I'm wondering if that's being considered uh, for uh, approved recreation over the summer. Yeah. Okay, so Steve, uh, thank you for the questions. And I want to say thank you for uh, your kind comment about uh, what I've tried to do, my team's tried to do here, which is to constantly make information available and, and take uh, questions from all of you that would help the people in New York City get a better sense of what's going on and obviously you know, answer important and tough questions that the public deserves answers to. So thank you. I want to thank everyone in the media because this has been you know, an uh, extraordinary situation where we're ha doing this so often and I think uh, the people of the city have appreciated that uh, this dialogue happens so regularly. So thank you to all. Um, to your two questions. So I'm not happy with what I'm hearing about Floyd Bennett Field. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, Steve, what I don't understand is exactly who all the parties to this were. Obviously, the MTA, my understanding is that situation is controlled, that space is controlled by the United States Park Service. Um, I don't know enough about what city agency's involvement was or wasn't. I'll get down to the bottom of that today and we can give you more of an answer later. But I can tell you I don't like what I'm seeing for the very reasons you outlined, that uh, we want people to have access to recreation for just the amount of time they need each day and obviously with social distancing, but people do need access to that recreation. People do need access to community gardens, again, following those rules. and. Um, I don't understand. It's not anything negative to the MTA. I just don't understand why, with so much less service going on, it would be necessary to knock out, you know, those opportunities for everyday people. And you know, I have to believe there are other alternatives. So we're we're happy to work with the MTA on other alternatives. But we'll come back to you today on that. On the beaches, I think we're starting with. Um, the notion that, first of all, we don't know what the next few months bring. The, the normal time we would have opened the beaches would have been a matter of weeks from now on Memorial Day. That was inconceivable from everything that we have been experiencing. Because remember, how do most people get to the beaches? They get on the subways, they get in buses, they drive their cars, and then a bunch of people congregate. That was not something we could possibly imagine for the near term. We are still fighting day to day to beat back this disease. You've been watching the indicator, Steve. We're making progress, but we're still not to the kind of progress we need. So that's why we knew we could not start the beach season anywhere near like normal. As I've said, we're open to later on in the summer, we may get an opportunity. And I think your point is well taken. If we get to something, if we get to a point where we could start to open up, how would we do it and how would we do it smartly? I, I think it's fair to say I could see a scenario where we would do social distancing and, and limits on the number of people. But I also want to uh, urge people to recognize that won't be easy. That's a lot to enforce. Comes with real problems and potential dangers. So that one would be a high bar from my point of view. We'd have to be really certain we were turning the corner on disease, really certain we could do it the right way and that we could enforce it properly. But it's a perfectly fair idea and something we're gonna look at as one of the options. But that's not happening overnight. That's something that would be down the road when we've had a lot more progress beating back this disease. Next we have Christina from Chalkbeat. Hi, Mayor. Um, thanks for taking my question. Um, there's uh, obviously and rightfully a lot of focus on mental health Right now, I'm just wondering if we can expect a specific plan for teachers and students who are also dealing with a lot right now with the shift to remote learning. Yeah, Christina, the, absolutely yes. The chancellor mentioned this uh, originally uh, a couple weeks ago, and I tried to amplify yesterday how much we're focused and concerned about the mental health needs of our kids. I've spoken with the first lady about it. Um, the First Lady and the Chancellor are working together to take uh, a lot of the initiatives that have been uh, created through Thrive and apply them in the coming months uh, with our kids remotely, but also to start the planning for September 
Uh, and we understand that September there's going to be a challenge in terms of mental health for our kids that's absolutely unprecedented. And we're gonna to have to do a lot in every school to support kids who have honestly been traumatized. So you're going to, in the not too distant future, hear the specific plans to address mental health needs of kids over the next few months. And then as we get closer to the opening of school, uh, definitely a plan is gonna be put out on mental health services in all schools uh, for September. And the First Lady and the Chancellor will be working on that together, and the First Lady is going to add. Yes, um, you should know that the mental health services that are provided to our young people are, are continuing, that teachers are being trained in social emotional learning, which of course deals with the children's uh, emotional needs, so that they are able to um, continue working with children online uh, to a certain extent. In the fall, we hope to have a more expanded program because we know that so many of our young people are going to come back uh, in distress. But we haven't stopped doing anything that we're already doing. Uh, we're, we're doing what we can virtually, training the teachers, um, bringing up to speed so that they will be ready in September. All right, thank you. Next, we have Melissa from News 4. Melissa? I don't know if we have Melissa. Are you there, Melissa? Hi, Mr. Mayor. How, How you doing? doing? How you doing? Sorry, I was checking on my daughter in school. That's important. You had your priorities right. Walked away at the wrong moment. So, thank you. We've been reporting that a few children hospitalized here in the city appear to be experiencing some of the same inflammatory symptoms that British officials warned about over last weekend. Some of the children have tested positive for COVID-19, while others have tested negative. But we're wondering what you're seeing big picture. Your health department says since the inflammatory symptoms are not required to be reported to city health officials, they can't say exactly how many children are experiencing these serious side effects right now. Is this something you want your health department to be tracking? And uh, what else do you know about this, if anything? Thank you for the question. Look. Um I'm concerned because, you know, Melissa, we've talked about from the beginning, we're dealing with the great unknown here. And I think we have to be vigilant all the time to any new development that might uh, give us a warning of something bigger. Because obviously the entire mission here is to save lives and particularly uh, precious is saving the lives of our kids. So um, I'm concerned about it. I don't pretend to have expertise on the exact reality, but I'm very concerned and I think We've got to figure out uh, how to understand it better and if it is something to be tracked. Let me turn to uh, Dr. Barbeau, and I know we have Dr. Eric Way, who's the Vice President of Health and Hospitals. I want to see if either of them would like to speak to this issue. So, Mr. Mayor, um, I will say that uh, I'll start with what we've been saying for a while. Every day we learn more and more about how this virus behaves both from a public health point of view as well as from a clinical point of view. And, you know, recently we have been talking about the way in which coronavirus can affect the, the heart uh, and the cardiovascular system. To date, we have not uh, heard of um, ways in which the coronavirus has been affecting children's cardiovascular system. We do have regular ongoing calls with infectious disease specialists throughout the city. We have webinars with them. Additionally, we meet on a regular basis through webinar with doctors, leaders in the intensive care units of all of the hospitals. And we have not seen this to date. Um, I've also been in communication with our medical examiner. Um, she has not noticed this in cases that she has seen, uh, but we are in contact with our academic partners to ensure that if this is a trend that's being seen uh, through our clinical partners, that we work collaboratively to understand it better. We are always uh, paying attention to what seems to be emerging not only from the worldwide literature, but also what we're experiencing here 
in New York City. Dr. Wei, anything you'd like to add? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so similar to, to Dr. Barbeau, um, I am not aware of this being a trend in New York City health and hospitals. I think uh, that was one of the things that we were most kind of, uh, I guess, appreciative of um, and being a father of two uh, toddlers, three and five and a, and a baby who's seven months old, um, you know, being scared for, for our children. Uh, this virus seems to not affect um, our, our young uh, patients uh, nearly as much as the older and those with comorbidities. Uh, but as Dr. Barbo mentioned, we are paying attention through our pediatrics council, our critical care councils, our emergency department councils, um, and we are not seeing a lot of, of children uh, testing positive for COVID or, or getting very ill, or ending up in our pediatric ICUs from, from COVID. But we are aware of the news and the, the literature that's ever changing out there about inflammatory uh, changes, Kawasaki disease, and we're paying very uh, close attention to that um, and also listening to our, our science and our experts. Last two for today. Next is Matt Chase from Newsday. Hey, thanks for taking my question. I appreciate it. Um, for the police commissioner, uh, regarding gatherings, what exactly will you be doing differently going forward from what you did last night? How will your summons uh, and arrest policy be different from what you did last night? And to what extent is the procedure changed for handling arrestees and s folks getting summons and physically uh, since the coronavirus? And uh, for Dr. Barbeau, can you explain in epidemiology the difference between absence of evidence and evidence of absence? Okay. Uh, Dr. Barbeau, why don't you take that first, since that sounds like uh, a question I would certainly not have the answer to. So why don't you take that one, and then we'll turn to the commissioner. Uh, you know, that's a really uh, good question. And when we say that there is absence of evidence, it means that there are not uh, a good amount of studies that have documented uh, evidence one way or another, um, what the particular finding in question or the particular question in question may be. Um, so that's an absence of findings. Um, and then the other part of your question, if you could restate it. Do we have Matt still there? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you can explain evidence of absence. Um, evidence of absence, meaning that scientific studies were done, clinical studies were done, observations, et cetera, and confirmed that there is no current association with the particular question in mind. Now, that's not to say that future studies may not find a finding, um, but that's what that means. Okay. Commissioner Shea. So, so what I'll say about the gatherings, uh, we're two months into um, this pandemic at this point. And, and when you look at how we as a police department have policed, um, I, I am biased, but I think we've done a good job of balancing and using discretion and working with New Yorkers from one end of the city to another. Um, in terms of whether it's in parks, whether it's at religious gatherings, whether it's uh, outside housing developments or whether it's on the street, lining up to buy groceries. I think we've gone into it uh, with an appreciation of this is tough for everyone and we gotta get through this together. And we, we've, we've empowered our officers for years now to, to use discretion. And I think that that has come through in this. By and large, you've seen New Yorkers um, cooperate. You've seen um, Incidents pop up. Certainly, we've had an increase in 311 calls. I, I view that as a good thing, that people are letting us know what's going on and, and taking uh, interest in their city, and it is their city. Um, overall, we've seen really few, when you think of the tens and hundreds of thousands at this point, interactions across this city in a, in a variety of circumstances. Arrests are the uh, far extreme. There have been some summonses, really not a lot, and usually it's been a mutual cooperation. 
But here's the only thing that's changed. We are beyond, at this point, asking people to comply. We cannot have, for the third time, what we had last night. And that is irrespective of any religion, any race, any part of this city. It is simply putting you at risk. It is putting your families at risk. It is putting the critical workers at risk that are already risking their lives, saying goodbye to their children, and going into the unknown in emergency rooms across this city every day. And it certainly, for the last time, is putting my cops at risk. And, and what you should take away from that is how really unnecessary it is. We grieved this weekend for two fallen detectives, but we did not come out. We did it from our home, by and large. And there is no reason that anyone in this city cannot do the same in this unprecedented time. Last question for today, Deborah Lee from Manhattan Times and Bronx Free Press. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I wanted to follow up on the conversation that's being had around testing and how the capacity for it continues to ramp up, both on the city and the state level, um, to the extent that we're talking about uh, expanding testing at NYCHA sites, at independent pharmacies, and the like. Um, in doing so, can you speak to whether, in fact, the guidance on residents seeking out testing has changed? Has more testing, in fact, then led to a conversation about inviting residents in the effort to both test and trace and identify uh, the illness and that as it continues to progress? In fact, are we saying to residents, are we changing the guidance and saying, uh, if you're asymptomatic, potentially, you should still uh, seek out testing to be certain? And then in light of that, are we looking at a prelude, essentially, to what's already happened in Chile? And we've heard Dr. Fauci discuss, which are, you know, essentially coronavirus certification uh, or some kind of identification that speaks to whether you've tested positive uh, and what that will mean. And then finally, when we talk about uh, this testing and tracing policy, um, what concerns uh, does the city have about how this will affect undocumented immigrants who are already concerned about, you know, the big brother quality of some of these uh, programs? and, in fact, the disincentives to come out and get tested because there is this follow-through in a way that potentially might be invasive and they would worry might well lead to dire consequences. Yeah, and so, Deborah Lee, appreciate it. The, let, me, let me work through these questions quickly, and, and our uh, medical colleagues might want to jump in as well, but let me, let me take the first stab. Uh, for the undocumented folks, look, this is a city that has gone out of its way to show absolute and total respect for all human beings who live here, regardless of documentation status. I think that's something that's deeply understood in immigrant communities, that we do not ask documentation status when we provide services, especially things like health care. Uh, NYPD does not ask documentation status. We go out of our way to make sure that records are not kept that would be problematic uh, you get medical care just like everybody else. So, um, and obviously the initiative that we uh, created with the Open Society Foundations to provide direct support to undocumented folks who don't have a, a livelihood is exceptional and, and says the level of commitment the city has to all human beings. So my hope is when it comes to something as important as knowing if you have a disease that obviously can be life-threatening to you and your family, that that is more important than anything else. Folks who have come here have come here overwhelmingly to try and better the lives of their families, uh, often from very, very you know, difficult and even tragic situations where they came from. So I would like to believe that notwithstanding the fears, there would be the first impulse is if someone needed testing, they would get testing and know that it would be kept confidential by the city of New York because we keep everything confidential. Um, in terms of your larger questions, has the guidance changed? In a sense, yes, but in another way, I wouldn't uh, say all the way. It's changed in the sense that we once had almost no testing in this city, uh, and then we had to try to use the little bit we had to focus on the sickest patients and the healthcare personnel and the first responders, and now we're able only in the last few weeks to open it up to broader communities, so that's definitely a change. 
Our message to people is that uh, getting tested is important, particularly if you are most vulnerable, older, and or have pre-existing conditions, so that's been consistent. But what will change for sure, much deeply, much more deeply in the next few weeks, is when we go to a, a huge test and trace approach, then we're saying to tens of thousands, ultimately hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, we want to maximize testing. And then we want to test anyone that, if you're a positive, if you test positive, we want to test the people that you had close contact with. So the guidance is changing, but it's going to change a lot more. Um, I think on the question of certificates, uh, that's something we have to think about for the future. It has been used as a tool in one way or another. A certificate or, or something that's an online registry has been used in different places. I think it's certainly a commendable idea, but we have not made any conclusions on that would have to be done in a smart way. Uh, there's a lot of things we'd have to think about legally, privacy, other issues. But it's certainly on the table as something we're looking at, uh, how you support a really broad gauge testing system and how you get us back to normal with the information that testing system provides. So uh, those are some answers. Uh, doctors, anything you want to add? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will um, add that it's important to tease apart the two tests that we're talking about, because I think all too often antibody tests get lumped in with testing for the actual infection. And so it's important for us, A, to tease that apart. With regards to testing for infection, the guidance remain in terms of wanting to make sure that individuals who have chronic underlying illnesses that put them at greater risk for bad outcomes um, are prioritized for testing. But then as the availability for testing increases, we wanna then uh, test more individuals. In addition to that, we are um, doing everything we can to maximize the number of ways in which we increase access to testing. And so recently we announced that we are moving forward, H&H, &H, and then we, through the public health lab, will also do um, nasal swabs instead of uh, nasal pharyngeal swabs, putting um, less of a strain on PPE. So that's how that testing arm has evolved. The, when we talk about testing for antibodies, we have to be very clear that there is no science that tells us that there is durable protection or immunity if someone tests positive for those antibodies. And so we wanna be very careful not to give false hope for people because there's no correlation with immunity. And in fact, there have been some preliminary studies that indicate that people can be potentially reinfected with COVID-19 in the same season. And so we're waiting for more studies to be done to tell us whether those findings are corroborated or not. I think where antibodies may be helpful for us in the future is to give us a better understanding in the next season if people who have uh, antibodies for this season get reinfected next season, then we'll have a better understanding of what those antibodies really mean and whether or not they are protective, and if they are protective, how long they last. Dr. Wei, anything you'd like to add? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, and I would, I would just uh, reinforce what Dr. Barbeau said. Um, the antibody tests, I think there's benefits even to our healthcare workers in terms of the psychological safety of, of knowing that I've been exposed and I wasn't one of the ones who ended up on a ventilator in the ICU, uh, but we don't know how much immunity, and so we don't want people to relax their social distancing or their PPE usage. And then on the undocumented immigrants uh, comment, I mean, that really resonates with health and hospitals, with uh, the mayor's administration. Uh, it is part of our ethos. It is in our mission statement. The two most important words are without exception. We want uh, to help New Yorkers live their healthiest lives without exception, we don't ask. I, as a doctor, don't care about your immigration status. I care about your health. And if that health is at risk because of COVID-19, I want you to get a test and I want to provide you the, the appropriate uh, treatments and results. 
Uh, and so I don't want anyone to think that at health and hospitals, we will be asking immigration status because we don't. Uh, we care about your health. Nicely said, doctor. Thank you. And let me conclude by us uh, going back to where we started, the extraordinary work, the heroic work uh, so many healthcare workers have done, so many first responders have done uh, over these weeks. Unprecedented, unimaginable uh, what so many have gone through and, and that no one could have foreseen. And yet the heroism has been so clear and so sharp. Uh, I want to thank the First Lady. I want to thank our police commissioner. Um, the idea that we will all support our healthcare workers and our first responders in every way is absolutely crucial. So it's, of course, everything that's been done up to now to give them protection, to get those PPEs, the personal protective equipment, and that effort is going to be ongoing, and we're going to deepen that effort. Uh, all we have done to try to support them and thank them, but now going deeper with testing, going deeper with mental health support, uh, we need to be there for them through this whole crisis and then beyond. Uh, and this is a good example when they say that phrase will leave no stone unturned. That's what we're talking about when it comes to supporting the heroes of this fight. There's a lot they need. There's a lot we have to give to them to support them. And everyone recognize uh, every time you say thank you to one of these heroes, every time you offer to help them in ways big and small. Uh, all those wonderful people have come out to applaud uh, at 7 o'clock at night. All the people have brought food and support to hospitals and to uh, our EMTs and paramedics and all of our first responders. Every bit of it helps. And we're going to be there for them because they have certainly been there for all of us. Thank you, everybody. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. How do we put this in perspective about how worried we should be? We're going to share the newest numbers and critical information on the outbreak. Vladimir Dutier is tracking the plight of the restaurant business. Vlad? You've been talking to doctors. What are they saying to you about their experiences? everybody, good to see you. I'm Vladimir Dutier, reporting here from the CBS News Upper West Side Bureau in Manhattan, while my colleague Anne-Marie Green is just across the way in Philadelphia from her home office. And we've got a lot to get to today, Anne-Marie. 
Yeah, we certainly do. We've got, you know, we've, we've passed a bit of a milestone here in this country. Uh, one million people have tested positive for the coronavirus. It's a pretty grim milestone, and it's coming as the president is really focusing on uh, more widespread testing in the hopes of getting the economy up and running again. So we're joined now by uh, Major Garrett to talk a little bit more about what the administration is saying. Uh, first off, Major, I want to ask you, has the administration or the president commented on this one million people positive milestone? No, not in the sense that it is a milestone that is sort of shocking and numerically almost unimaginable four or five weeks ago. The administration has focused much more on adaptation at the state level, either it's testing or the phased reopening and the federal guidelines and a very important executive order issued by the president last night using the Defense Production Act to assert that meat processing slaughterhouses for all protein industries is in the national security interest of the country is a imperative part of the U.S. food chain. And through this executive order, setting out very specific guidelines for worker safety, but also mandating that those slaughterhouses, we also call the meat processing plants, stay up and running. And that's a very important move by the administration to deal with anxiety and realities in terms of worker safety, keeping the food supply chain up and running, and declaring that these processing, meatpacking, slaughterhouses have to stay open. You know, Major, uh, it, it's a tough call uh, because you're essentially, and, and it goes to the question that we've been talking about uh, for the last couple of days now with this push to reopen uh, the economy, to reopen the country, certain parts of the country. On one hand, certainly people do want to get back to work. People do want to get a sense of normalcy back in their lives. On the other, uh, you're essentially saying to folks, you've got to go back to work, um, even though these conditions may not be safe. And of course, there are laws for companies to keep employees safe when they are working. And so if someone, and I've seen, uh, for example, certain governors suggesting that if people choose not to go back to work because they're concerned about their health or their safety, that they may be considered um, not employable. They may actually get fired for those reasons. So how is the administration seeking to balance those two, those two sort of uh, uh, polar opposites? Well, let's just talk about this executive order, because it is an example of the administration declaring something part of critical infrastructure. That's the terminology for the slaughterhouses, meat processing. That's poultry, pork, cattle, everything. So over the weekend, OSHA, uh, Occupational Safe and Healthy Administ Health Administration, and the CDC placed guidelines for safe worker treatment within these plants. Well, under the executive order, those are no longer guidelines. Those are now federal policy under the Defense Production Act. So for those who were saying, what would the administration do in terms of worker safety? Well, it's actually codified things through this executive order. And I've talked to people within the industry who saw the executive order and said, wow, that puts some real teeth in these worker safety. And it gives us actual hardcore guidelines about doing this and the means by which to keep the processing slaughterhouse plants going. So in that example, there is, it appears, a equitable weighing of these desires and pressures. Worker safety, keeping the things open, keeping the food chain and the supply chain functioning. About that, because as we learned when this COVID-19 experience was just dawning, Anxiety about future supplies can lead to overconsumption, which some people interpreted or branded as hoarding. That can disrupt the supply chain even if it's fully functioning. So all of these things, at least in this particular instance, and I'm not talking about every instance around the country, because there are millions of adaptations going on in every state, in every household right now. But this is an example of the administration, it appears, trying to weigh a lot of different and difficult at times pressure points and doing so in rather quick order because over the weekend there were these alarms being raised by those in the various poultry industries, meat packing, pork and everything else saying maybe there'll be some disruptions, maybe there'll be some real problems and pretty quickly there's this executive order. So. When it comes to the deeper question you asked, Vlad, about how do governors do this, 
The administration, through the president's voice, has said, I'm going to let you make your own decisions, and our guidelines will be there to reinforce or to question you if you are moving too rapidly. But even in the case of Georgia, which, to the president's own point of view and words, reopened certain parts of its economy too rapidly, all the governor, Brian Kemp, got there were some sharp words, nothing else. So there is a lot of latitude being given by this administration to governors generally, but on something like this, where it comes to the processing, the slaughtering of those things in the meat supply chain, very specific guidelines and very sharp declaration from the federal government that this is critical infrastructure and it must stay open and it must stay productive. I just want to point out that, you know, some of these facilities were shut down because thousands within the meatpacking industry have already tested positive for the coronavirus. And I'm presuming that they were maintaining some sort of guidelines to diminish the spread of the virus. So it's already an issue within that industry. That's why they were shutting down or slowing down their production. Um, but listen, I got to ask you about something else that major that made some big time headlines. Mike Pence visited the Mayo Clinic um, yesterday. He did not wear a mask. There is this stunning photo that is circulating of everyone in the room, doctors and patients and whoever else is in the room, all wearing masks, and the vice president is not. Have you heard from the vice president or his team any sort of explanation for this? Oh, sure. The, vi the vice president said it to reporters traveling with him. I was, I te I'm tested all the time. I was tested recently. I'm negative, so I don't need to wear a mask. Yesterday, for my show, Debriefing the Briefing, I talked to Dr. Ali S. Khan, who is an epidemiologist by training. He was with the CDC for many, many years. He's now the dean of the College of Medicine at the University of Nebraska. And he said, look, everyone should and must be wearing masks. And public officials who give those guidelines ought to reinforce that messaging because it's just good health, public health practice, and it is good modeling practice. But the vice president knows that the man he works for and the man he answers to every single day has said, I'm not wearing one in public. And Vice President Pence knows that there are things about even modeling in the era of COVID-19 that the president perceives as weak. And masks is something that he has said out loud, I'm not going to do it. And the vice president knows that if he did it, there would be another array of questions about why isn't President Trump doing that? placing pressure on President Trump, possibly. Vice President Pence is not going to do that. So he's willing to take the heat for not wearing a mask in public, even though everyone around him is, and even though he was briefed by the Mayo Clinic through its own words about its policy of wearing masks, he was not going to cross that line with the president. All right, uh, Major Garrett, I know you got to run, Major. Uh, really important information there. Uh, and we should point out that the Mayo Clinic uh, deleted a tweet uh, where they had indicated that they had given uh, the vice president that, those guidelines. Um, Major, thank you as always. We appreciate it. Sure. Tonight at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. You know, there's just something so profoundly sad about this young woman. The prison was aware of her mental illnesses because they're the ones who classified her as seriously mentally ill. The only treatment that you're getting is that mental health professional coming in and saying, are you wanting to kill yourself? Do you feel qualified? To deal with mental health? No, <laughs> not at all. Why didn't somebody help my son? They just look at him like a number. They're not people to them. I don't care who's at fault. You need to get it done because my clients are dying because you're not doing your jobs. Presented by GoDaddy. As DJs and artists turn to social media to stream live music while social distancing at home, one startup is innovating in the audio ecosystem by offering users what they say is a richer and more immersive listening experience. Here's more from the founder of Iris about what sets it apart. In the last 10 years, we've seen a real decline in the quality of audio, um, partly because of the way it's recorded, and secondly, the price we're paying for 10,000 songs in our pocket. 
from the vinyl area to the CD area and then down to this digital area now. And we've become accustomed to a very, very low quality of audio. And when we listen or engage with live music, our brain is very active in the listening experience. And we're picking up this spatial information reflecting from the walls, the shape of the room, your distance from the artist. What Iris does is takes you back into a heightened live experience and gives you the information as if you were almost in infinite phase in every seat in that arena. In the last year or so, we're really seeing people fall in love with audio again, with the boom of podcasts. Um, there's a huge following into sound healing. Um, and, and I think it's the right time to innovate in this space and really connect those two worlds of redefining the quality of audio, but also our own personal well-being. At its core, Iris is a B2B software business. We intend to sell our technology into other content providers to give people the ability to have their hour and a half, two hours a day of listening well. But we took the challenge upon ourselves to develop what we think is the perfect listening device. So we've created a headphone that we'll launch in the next month or two, um, which has got the technology incorporated in it. We're very early on in research, both internally and externally, and we're working with major research universities and hospitals around the world to really understand different facets of how this technology is benefiting the brain. So looking at our partnership with Aston Martin Red Bull Racing, Formula One team on how the drivers can train with Iris in the simulator to give them a more real experience, focus themselves before the race by listening to music through Iris technology and engaging the brain in that unique way. I think if you try and disrupt any industry, um, particularly in the tech world, you're going to ruffle feathers um, and there are a lot of challenges in that. This is new and therefore catches people by surprise. So we get a bit of pushback sometimes, but we're very well supported by some real leaders in the music industry. Um, one of our investors, Roger Taylor from Queen. So the validation is there from, from the industry as well. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now! We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom? Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. How do we put this in perspective about how worried we should be? We're going to share the newest numbers and critical information on the outbreak. Vladimir Dutier is tracking the plight of the restaurant business. Vlad? You've been talking to doctors. What are they saying to you? All right, let's take you now to New York State, where Governor Andrew Cuomo is delivering his daily briefing on the pandemic here as it, it affects New York State. And in fact, grim numbers, 330 people have died in the state in the past 24 hours. Let's listen to the governor. Buffer. We have to have 30 percent of ICU beds. We have to have that buffer before we start uh, bumping up against total capacity. And we have to watch the hospitalization rate and the diagnostic testing rate, how many are positive, how many are negative, which will take on a continuous basis. You see that number start going up, worry. But it's all based on the data and the numbers. I'm sorry. And the rate of transmission, RT rate of transmission, not road and track, rate of transmission has to be 1.1 or less. We just said Germany is at 0.1. Because the 1.1 1 
that is textbook outbreak. So watch the numbers and watch the transmission rate. And how do you do that? You do that with testing, right? Uh, and that's why everybody's talking about testing. The testing allows you to continually test, sample, how many people, how many, uh, how many people are positive, how many people are negative. You see the positive start to increase through your day-to-day -day testing. That is a pause sign. We were about doing about 20,000 tests. We said we wanted to double that. We're now on average about 30,000 tests per day, which is a dramatic increase, not where we need to be, but a dramatic increase. Where we are now, you should know, is New York State is doing more than most countries are doing. So we have been very aggressive in testing, and we have made great progress, and New Yorkers should feel good about that, but we have more to do. Uh, on elective surgeries, we had canceled all elective surgeries so we could have increased capacity in the hospitals. When you cancel elective surgeries, hospitals feel a financial pinch because that's where they make their money is on elective surgeries. So for areas that don't have a fear of a COVID surge, we're going to allow elective surgeries to begin. That's primarily in counties upstate. Again, counties where we're still worried about a surge in the COVID beds, uh, we're not going to open it up to elective surgery until we know we're out of the woods on the COVID virus. Uh, and this is a list of counties that are eligible now for elective surgeries. I'll do an executive order on that today. We've been worried about frontline workers because they are the heroes who are out there every day so everybody else can stay home. Uh, somebody asked me uh, yesterday on a radio interview, uh, well, you know, you're out there every day. Uh, are you taking care of yourself? I'm out there every day. Forget me. Uh, I'll tell you who's out there every day. The nurses who were in the emergency room, the doctors who were in the emergency room, the police officer his, who is going into homes and apartments uh, because there's a domestic disturbance. Uh, the EMTs, the fire department, the delivery worker who goes to 50 doors a day and gets paid. Those people are out there every day. Uh, so they're the ones who are really doing the work. Uh, compared to them, uh, what I do is de minimis. And they're doing it not because they get paid a lot of money, not because people say thank you, God bless you. Uh, they're doing it because it's their value and their honor, and their pride, and their dignity. And they show up. Even when it's hard, they show up. My hat is off to them. But I want to make sure that we do what we need to do to protect them, that they have the equipment, they have the PPE, they have our respect, they have our gratitude. Uh, and I also want to make sure we're testing so we get them the results of tests so they can be taking care of themselves. Uh, I also want to see if we have a significant problem in any of those frontline workforces. So we're doing testing. We started with the New York City Fire Department and New York City Police Department. What we found so far, Fire Department, which also has the EMTs, tested 17% positive, NYPD tested positive, number much higher in the FDNY EMTs. We believe that's because the EMT number is driving it up, but we have to do more numbers and more research to determine that. Remember, the EMTs, uh, they are the front line. They're the ones who are, are there assisting the person in the closest contact in many ways, uh, FDNY also. But we want to find out exactly what's going on uh, they, they compare to a downstate average of the general population of about 18%. Uh, and again, we'll do further research, further surveys to look at it by race and gender also. We're also going to do the same thing with the transit workers, the people who drive the buses, the subways, who clean the buses and the subways. Without those buses and subways, the essential workers couldn't get to work. Why didn't we just close down subways and buses? Because you close down the subways and the buses in New York City. Uh, don't expect the nurses and the doctors to be able to get to the hospital. Don't expect the delivery worker 
to be able to deliver food when you ring on your telephone. Uh, so we need the, that public transportation to transport the essential workers. Uh, but those frontline workers are at risk. So we're going to do additional testing for the uh, transport workers. I also commented yesterday, uh, the Daily News had pictures of things that are going on in the New York City subway system, uh, where the cars were filthy, they were disgusting, uh, homeless people were there with all their belongings. Uh, and it was not just the Daily News picture. It reflected what has been in the press and what people have been saying, which is the deterioration of the conditions in the subways. Crime, some crimes are up in the subways, even though ridership is down 90%. I don't even know how mathematically that is possible. Uh, the trains are filled with homeless people, and you're not doing the homeless any favor. I've worked with the homeless all my life. To let homeless people stay on the trains in the middle of a global health pandemic with no masks, no protective equipment, you're not helping the homeless. Uh, letting them endanger their own life and endanger the lives of others is not helping anyone. So I told the MTA uh, yesterday, in two days, which means tomorrow, I want a full plan how do we disinfect every train every night, period. Any essential worker who shows up and gets on a train should know that that train was disinfected the night before. We want them to show up. We don't want them to stay home. We owe it to them to be able to say, the train you ride, the bus you ride, has been disinfected and is clean. Also, state and local funding uh, from Washington is essential. This is now turning into a uh, political brawl on state and local funding. Uh, more and more, some of the elected officials in Washington are saying they're against it. Uh, they're led by Senator Mitch McConnell, who leads the Senate, who makes it blatantly political. No blue state bailout. No blue state bailout. What is he trying to say? Uh, the states that have coronavirus are Democratic states. And uh, he's a Republican, so he doesn't want to help the Democratic states. Uh, he went so far as to say, well, he'd be in favor of the states going bankrupt. First, uh, states have never gone bankrupt. States can't go bankrupt. Uh, there are serious co constitutional questions about whether or not a state can go bankrupt, declare bankruptcy. Uh, and you need a federal law that would allow the states to declare bankruptcy, even if you got around the constitutional question on bankruptcy. Uh, so if he believed that, if it wasn't just political uh, rhetoric uh, and personal vitriol, then pass a law that allows states to declare bankruptcy. He would have to do that. Uh, and I dare him to do that uh, and get that bill signed by the president. So, uh, but to, to make it partisan is what is most disturbing. And you can see they're now rallying the partisan troops uh, Senator Scott from Florida says, we're supposed to bail them out. We versus them. We're supposed to bail them out. It's we and it's them. That's not right. Who is we and who is them? Who is we and who is them? Them, the people who had coronavirus. They are the ones who had the coronavirus. We without the virus are supposed to bail out those people who have the virus. What an ugly sentiment. First of all, on the facts, it's not even close to right. And why they would even want to go down this road when the facts damn everything they're saying. And there are still facts. I know it's hard to communicate facts in this environment. Uh, I know a lot of the filters 
don't communicate facts. They all communicate spin now. Everybody has their own spin. But there are still, still facts that are not political theater, right? New York State bails them out every year. They're not bailing us out. We bail them out every year. New York State pays $29 billion into that federal pot, 29 billion more every year that we never get back. Our state contribution into the federal pot, the United States of America pot, every year we put in $29 billion more than we take out. On the other hand, they take out every year $37 billion more than they pay to the federal government. Senator Mitch McConnell, you are bailing out New York when every year you take out more from the kitty, the federal pot, $37 billion more than you put in? Who is bailing out whom? Senator Scott, Florida? You're going to bail us out? You take out $30 billion more every year than you pay in. How dare they? How dare they when those are the facts? How long are you going to play the American people and assume they're stupid? They are not. And they can add. And they know facts. And I don't care what the news media tries to do to distort these facts. They are numbers. And they are facts. And they can't be distorted. And this is every year. And look, what this is really about, it's the Washington doublespeak. You look at the bills that they want to pass and who they want to help. They want to fund the hotels, the restaurants, the airlines, the big corporations. That's who they want to fund. Well, who do state and local governments fund? State and local governments fund police, firefighters, nurses, school teachers, food banks. That's who I want to fund. And that's what it means to fund a state and local government. And that's the choice that they're making. Everybody applauds. The healthcare workers, jets fly over and tribute to the healthcare workers, that's all nice. Saying thank you is nice. How about actually rewarding them and making their life easier? How about giving them hazard pay? How about helping with their child care? How about helping families who can't feed their kids right now? How about helping the police and helping the firefighters and all the people who are out there right now killing themselves to make life easier for us. That's what this is really about. They want to fund corporate America. That's who puts money in their pockets. And I say, let's fund working Americans. That's the choice. Bail out us, them. No, it's just theater. It's just smoke and mirrors to avoid the American people seeing the reality, which is whose pocket they want to put money in versus whose pocket state and local governments want to fund. The reason it is so disturbing to me, I'm not surprised by anything in politics. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly for many, many years. I was in Washington for eight years. I know what it's like. But there was, if there was ever a time that one could reasonably believe you could put aside partisan politics, if there was ever going to be a moment where we could say, you know what, let's stop just for one moment the partisanship, the ugliness, the anger, the deception. Let's just stop for one moment. If there was going to be a one moment to hit the pause button, the moment would be now. 
You have human suffering. You have people dying. You can't stop the politics, even in this moment. Even in this moment, when people are dying all across the country, you still want to play your politics? That's what this is about. And that's why it is so disturbing on a fundamental level. Politics, I'm getting up and I'm reading that death toll number. I'm speaking to the widows and the brothers and the sisters and the children of people who died. And then we're going to play politics with funding that's necessary to save people's lives? I mean, when does it stop? And the disconnect is between the political leadership and the people. Because the American people, it's not them. They are principled, they are kind, they are better than what they are getting. The American instinct is to help each other in crisis. The American instinct is to be good neighbors. The American instinct was the farmer who sent me the one mask to help a New Yorker when he only had five masks and a wife with one lung and underlying illness. And he sends one of his five masks to New York. Think about that generosity, that charity, that spirit. That's America. Why? Because we're good neighbors, because we care about one another. America was when I said, we need help in our emergency rooms and hospitals, and 95,000 nurses and doctors from across the nation said, we will come to New York to help. We'll come into the emergency room. We'll come into the hospital. I understand it's COVID. I'll leave my family, and I'll come to help yours. That's America. That's who we are. And that's who we have shown ourselves to be in the middle of this crisis. The crisis brings out the best and the worst. Yes. And the best of America is beautiful. And that's what we've seen. Because yes, we are tough. Yes, we are smart. Yes, we're disciplined. Yes, we're united. Yes, we're loving. Loving, because we are Americans. And that's who we are and how we are as Americans. And I just hope the political leadership of this nation understands how good we are as a people. And the textbook says politicians lead. Elected officials lead. No, sometimes the people lead and the politicians follow. And that's where we are today. Follow the American people. Look at what they're doing. Look at how they're reacting. And politicians, try to be half as good as the American people. I want to show you a self-portrait that was done by American people. This is a self-portrait of America, OK? That's a self-portrait of America. And you know what it spells? It spells love. That's what it spells. You have to look carefully, but that's what the American people are saying. We received thousands of masks from all across America, unsolicited, in the mail, homemade, creative, personal, with beautiful notes from all across the country, literally. Just saying, thinking about you, we care, we love you, we want to help. And this is just people's way of saying we care. 
and we want to help. This is what this country is about, and this is what Americans are about. A little bit more of this, and a little bit less of the partisanship and the ugliness, and this country would be a better place. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Questions, Bernadette? Regarding the MTA and cleaning, um, you want it done on a 24-hour basis. How will this be done? I didn't say on a 24-hour basis, Bernadette. I said the... I said, when people get into the train in the morning, they had to know that that train was disinfected the night before. So what time will this happen and will it impact service? I don't know. I told the MTA, give me a plan whereby you will clean and disinfect every train every night so that I can say to the essential workers who are killing themselves for our state, we are keeping the subways open for you, and when you get on the subway in the morning or in the afternoon, know that that car was disinfected the night before. How realistic is this, and is there money for that? It's realistic. It's an essential. How, how realistic is it? What is the alternative? Essential workers go to work. By the way, you may get infected with the coronavirus on the train on the way to work. That's not realistic. I'm not going to do that. How come this hasn't been done prior? I mean, we have been starting. Uh, it is a tremendous undertaking that has never been done before. Uh, and you're going to have to get uh, homeless people into shelters where they can get housing and the services they need. So that's a second operation. And the MTA has been going back and forth with the NYPD about this for weeks and weeks and weeks. The MTA hired private security guards to help. But all a private security guard can do is call 311, which is the city hotline, which then has them call the NYPD, who are there in the first place. So the M MTA's story is they're at their wit's end. But uh, what I said is, look, I don't care. I don't care who's to blame. I don't want to point fingers. I don't care. I'm at a place where I'm dealing with people losing their lives every day, okay? I just want to get it done, and I will get it done. Just tell me what I need to do to get it done. Let's start telling the truth. Let's stop with this filters and everyone covering their own rear end and uh, people skewing facts to cover their own rear end. And let's start telling the truth, the blunt truth. And if it makes some people unhappy, that's the way it's going to be. Uh, but it has to stop. The trains have to be clean. The homeless need the services that they need. And we have to be able to do it as a society. We have to. Tell me what it takes to clean the trains and disinfect the trains so I know that I can say to the essential workers, it's safe to go on those trains. You don't think it should be on a 24-hour basis? Because right now they do a 72-hour cleaning and then other I don't. Areas. I'm not going to do a cleaning schedule. I don't do that. I told them, give me a plan as to how to make sure every train is cleaned so that when the train comes in in the morning, it is cleaned. It's their job to figure out the schedule and how they do it, but however it has to be done, uh, I will do whatever I have to do to make that happen. You can't be in a position where you say, we're gonna send a plain tribute to the nurses and we're gonna applaud the nurses at Elmhurst Hospital, and yesterday I got out of my car and I applauded the nurses uh, in Syracuse and the doctors in Syracuse, and I said on behalf of every New Yorker, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for what you did. On behalf of every New Yorker, I believe that. But then on the at the same time, if that's what you believe, 
Well, then help them. And you know that they're getting on the subways to go to work. Make sure the subways are clean. Do you tell homeless people? What should, what should be done with homeless people? Homeless right people now, should be in shelter. Look, I've been working on the homeless um, issue. Bernadette, I've been working on the homeless issue since I was 20-something years old. I did the first plan for Mayor David Dinkins on how to help the homeless in New York City. Mayor Dinkins accepted it. Next mayor was Rudy Giuliani. He came in, he accepted it. We made tremendous progress on the homeless. I then went to Washington. I did a homeless plan for Bill Clinton uh, for the nation on how to help ho the homeless. He accepted it. We implemented it. Uh, it uh, made tremendous progress. It was called the Continuum of Care. This federal government still is operating the program. We have done this before. This is no false, this is a false choice. Well, the homeless are on the trains. They have a right to be on the train. No one wants to live their lives on a subway train. And we have a higher obligation as a society uh, than to say, okay, you can sleep in a subway car. No, you deserve a shelter that is safe, and services if you need them to help you improve your life. That's what we should offer, and that's what we will. So Jimmy? Today we've got more uh, problems with nursing homes, more infections, more deaths. Is the state at any point going to take action to set up maybe some kind of overflow facility for nursing home patients, as we've seen in other states? Uh, and what facility, not, um, sir? One major source of controversy has been your policy that nursing homes have to accept COVID patients subject to all the, the restrictions. But it seems in many ways that's setting up an impossible standard. So is New York going to set up some kind of overflow facility? There have been calls we to have use done these that federal too. facilities. All right, let's do the facts again, okay? We've done that. Just let me give let me let me give you the fact, okay? Because facts. We're talking about facts. You can have an opinion. But you can't have your own facts, right? Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. A nursing home takes a COVID person if, capital I, capital F, if they can adequately care for that person. If they cannot adequately care for that person, they say, I can't adequately care for a COVID person. Fine. Either they transfer that person to a different facility or they transfer, call the Department of Health and say, we have to transfer that person. We have other facilities. We have COVID only overflow facilities. Just what you're talking about. We have it. We've discussed this. So we can do that. But it starts with their determination. They have to say, I can't provide for this person. As long as they say, I can't provide for this person. And by the way, nobody even asks why. It's just, I can't provide for this person. OK, we'll take the person. And we have overflow facilities. Nick. Uh, Governor, and maybe this is a question for the commissioner, Commissioner Zucker. Um, uh, there's a Department of Health guidance that essentially allows asymptomatic nursing home staffers to work with COVID positive uh, patients. Some local officials are raising some concerns with this because it means people are still going to work while they're asymptomatic and are COVID positive. Is there any concern that you have with nursing home staffers still going to work even though they've tested positive for coronavirus? Yeah. So uh, the patients who are your question about being asymptomatic, we, we make sure that they have the necessary precautions that they need if they're going in there uh, to care for other individuals there, and that, that includes all of the PPE, uh, and we monitor them, and we're working on a way to test, uh, and we are testing uh, individuals who are in the nursing homes, both the workers as well as the patients. Is there any indication of how many nursing home staffers are COVID positive, asymptomatic, and are still going to work every day? We are looking, we are looking at those numbers. Governor, hashtag extend the lockdown is trending on Twitter today. Yesterday you said one of your fears was that, one of your fears early on, was that essential workers would not go to work out of fear of coronavirus. 
As you get ready to open business businesses in the state, are you worried that the next round of workers will not want to go back to work, will be, will be fearful of going back to work? I, I, just to so understand the question, uh, extend the lockdown is trending, meaning people want to extend the lockdown and not open up? Yes. Okay. Last week, your question was, we had the protest outside, people wanted to go to work, and I was oppressing people by keeping them in lockdown. So today, I'm not, I am uh, may artificially open the lockdown? The people outside said that they wanted to go back to work. And these now, people these are saying people are they saying don't want to go back to work. Because they're, they are fearful of, they're still fearful of the okay. coronavirus. So we have people last week protesting because they want to go back to work. This week we have people protesting because they don't want to go back to work. Yeah. Yes. Welcome to America. Uh, that's right. You have some people who say they want to go back to work, liberate democracy, you have other people who say, I don't want to go back to work. I want to live. Yes. What I'm saying is, I hear both voices. I hear the politics. I feel the tension. I get the tension. Let's decide on the facts. Because this is emotion on both sides, right? And I get the emotion because this is an emotional time. Everybody's under stress. Everybody's anxious, mental health issues are way up, domestic violence is way up, alcoholism is way up, substance abuse is way up. People are anxious. These decisions we have to make without emotion and we have to make them on the facts. And I'm not gonna be swayed this week by this one and now the next week by the other one. Make the decisions on the facts, make the decisions on the numbers, I laid out yesterday 12 steps, first plan that we've ever seen on the numbers. You can reopen if you don't increase hospitalizations and you don't increase the infection rate because you can't overwhelm the hospital. What does that mean? Here are the numbers. Here are the numbers. And we'll make the decision on the numbers. We've said from day one, follow the data. Follow the numbers. Do you have a concern, though, from some small business owners is that their employees went on unemployment and now they may not be able to get those employees back. So is there a way to deal with that if a business tries to reopen and then they can't get their workers back to function? Forced labor? Not in this country. Governor, Governor Bill de Blasio. Still, um, Governor, who are the 900 to 1,000 New Yorkers who are still coming into hospitals every day for COVID? Are they family members? I think you might have mentioned that yesterday. Are frontline workers? Do we know who these people are? Marina, I don't know that we have a statistical breakdown. The 1,000 people are troubling to me for all the progress we made. I mean, just put it in perspective. If I came in here one day and said, we have 1,000 people who tested positive for the COVID virus. You'd say, wow. In one day? Yeah. So it is startling news. The only thing that uh, makes it uh, less startling is that relative to everything we've gone through, it's relatively positive news. I don't know that we have any data, though. They're predominantly downstate New York, right? They track the statewide numbers predominantly downstate, western New York, upstate. But I don't know if we have any breakdown of who they are, where they're coming from. It's by region, so we know which hospitals they're going into, but not necessarily people's occupations. The governor announced a couple of weeks ago a study with the University of Albany, the Department of Health, on diagnostic testing to collect a lot more demographic data. So we know who's getting tested, who's positive. That doesn't necessarily result in hospitalization rates, but it will give us a better sense of who's testing positive in the state. That's not ready yet. They've just begun that study. Governor, why did you stress that New York was the quickest to shut down after the first known state, when many other states since then have responded swifter? Look, what's one thing you would change about New York's initial response going forward, just based on what we know now as a lesson learned? Yeah, I said at the time, New York was 
the fastest state to shut down. We went from our first case to total shutdown in 19 days. Uh, that's, that at the time was the fastest shutdown. Since then, other states that came later that saw what was going on uh, moved faster. Governor, uh, if I read your charts correctly, it appears that Saratoga Hospital can resume elective procedures, but Glens Falls Hospital cannot. Why is that? And as long as we're talking about Saratoga, how do you feel about the racetrack opening up this summer if they can uh, guarantee that uh, their employees and their staff are safe? Yeah. The Saratoga Guns Falls, do you know that? So some individual hospitals, if they have to, they have to meet the governor's criteria, the criteria that established by the Department of Health, which is 30% bed capacity overall, 30% ICU bed capacity, and then not an uptick in a number of COVID patients per day. So some of the individual hospitals don't meet one of those tests, and some of the counties haven't met that test. So that's why you see some of the differences in the regions, just based on the hospitalizations of those specific regions. So the Saratoga and Glens Falls hospitals are not too terribly far apart. Many people consider them to be in the same region. Right. The issue is, though, the, 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 the bed, they have the bed capacity that they have. If there are emerging issues where they think they do have the capacity, the Department of Health has established an exemption policy, but they want to review that to make sure that there is actual capacity at those hospitals because you don't want to be overwhelmed. So what they're seeing in that data are increases in hospitalizations potentially, so we want to make sure that those beds are available as potential infections increase. Yeah, the, this runs into the, our new concept of attractive nuisance, although the lawyers would say uh, this is an improper use of the term, which it is but we'll just bother the, bother the lawyers a little bit. Uh, you can't open an attraction that could bring people from across the state to that attraction and overwhelm a region. State Fair in Syracuse, uh, Saratoga Racetrack. I don't think we have time, first of all, but today, I don't think you can open those unless we do it statewide. Because there is such a pent up demand to get out of the house and do something. You open the Saratoga Racetrack, I guarantee you have the highest attendance in the history of the Saratoga Racetrack. You will have people from the entire Northeast region driving to the Saratoga Racetrack just because they want to get out of the house and they want to get out Now you could say, well, that's great for the Saratoga racetrack, but density is not our friend, right? Even when you talk about opening a venue, you look at some of the pictures of some of the states that are opening venues, two seats apart, six feet, six feet apart. You know, how do you do six feet apart at the racetrack? How do you do six feet apart at the state fair? How do you do six feet apart at the racetrack or the state fair when you have double the attendance you've ever had and people are all crammed in there, you know? So I think it would have to be a statewide opening, coordinate with Connecticut, coordinate with Jersey. Otherwise, you will have a much, much more dense situation if you wind up being the only attraction in town, and town is a tri-state region. Let me just make sure I put an exclamation point in a, in a point that I was trying to make uh, earlier. This political patina, this politicalization of what we're going through in this country is extraordinarily dangerous. We are dealing with probably the most dramatic situation we've dealt with in modern political history. We're dealing with a situation that we don't really understand and we don't know how to deal with. This is all uncharted water. I've talked to every expert on the globe. Nobody has been here before. It's going to take us at our best to navigate this to save lives, at our best. At our best, we have to be working together. We have to be logical. We have to be cooperative. We have to be sane. We have to work with people who sometimes we don't like. We have to work across the aisle. We have to be at our best. When you start to politicize this situation and you start to say red and blue and this team and that team, you may as well take a wedge and 
hammer it right into the middle of this country. And if you do that during this time, and this becomes a political football, or closing and opening becomes a political football, or funding becomes a political football, or this becomes a finger pointing blame game, and you divide this country, the worst could lie ahead. We think we're coming out of it, but that's only if we do what we have to do. And what you hear coming out of Washington, and I was there for eight years, I've heard this music before. This is the music of a campaign season. This is a music of a rally and balloons, and it's us versus them, and we're good and they're bad, and that is poison right now as to where we are. Thank you, guys. And where do I throw to? All right, so we've just been listening to uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo give his regular briefings about what's happening in New York. And as you can see, some of the questions are pivoting uh, towards uh, an incremental reopening. Um, he was talking a lot about the fact that, um, you know, all facilities have to sort of be working together. Um, what has been happening in New York City while the coronavirus pandemic has been occurring and people have been staying home is that homeless people have taken over the subways. And so the subways system needs to be cleaned on a regular basis. Right now, according to some of the reporters there, it's cleaned every 72 hours or so. So, you know, people aren't going to want to travel to work, even if their work starts to open up, if they don't feel like the subway system is safe and other uh, facilities that are available. So you heard, um, you know, the uh, governor sort of wrestling with the incremental steps uh, moving forward as he's watching the curve in his uh, state flatten a bit, but still very high numbers of people um, dying as a result of the coronavirus, but at least the number isn't going up. Um, for now, though, we're going to take a little bit of a quick break. We're going to continue our coverage of the pandemic and all the other news that you need to know. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. How do we put this in perspective about how worried we should be? We're going to share the newest numbers and critical information on the outbreak. Vladimir Dutye is tracking the plight of the restaurant business. Vlad? You've been talking to doctors. What are they saying to you about their experiences?
As countries around the world begin to ease their coronavirus restrictions, a lot of people are wondering whether or not we'll go back to the way life was and the world was before the coronavirus. So we want to bring in Peter Engelke. Peter, you are the deputy director and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. And we're not talking about, you know, life in the U.S., your day-to-day -day life, but we're talking about, you know, the world and the U.S. on the world stage. So the relationship between the U.S. and China on the world stage was, I don't think it could be, it could be um, categorized as being uh, particularly positive. Um, you know, the U.S. and China have been in an in a ongoing uh, spat over trade and, and uh, the rules surrounding trade for quite some time. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, I think was and still is a rising concern in uh, Washington-based foreign policy circles about what China's intentions are on the global stage and uh, whether or not China is going to um, uh, become a full partner in the sort of the internet within the international system or whether or not it will turn into a, a, a rival uh, to the United States and, and possibly even into, eventually into an adversary. And so that was, that was where the U.S.-China relationship was, I would say, before the pandemic uh, struck. So I think the question now is, how has that is that how is the pandemic changing uh, that relationship looking forward how might it change that uh, let me ask you about the credibility of the United States around the world. Uh, how has the U.S. response to uh, the coronavirus pandemic impacted the credibility of this country uh, and its perception, uh, perhaps? that has existed, you know, for many, many years, perhaps going back to the initiation of the Marshall Plan um, as a global leader. Do other countries, and I don't mean, you know, Russia and, and China, I'm talking about our allies within NATO, for example, do they still see the United States as a global leader, one that is a reliable partner when it comes to attacking or taking on or confronting a crisis that is seen as a global threat? Right. So you're absolutely correct in that after the Second World War, the U.S. and its its partners at the time, mostly European, but also some East Asian partners, and eventually expanding to, to many other parts of the world, um, the U.S. led uh, an effort to build out of the rubble of the Second World War a set of institutions, a set of alliances um, uh, based around the premise that cooperating and coordinating is better than, than uh, fighting one another. And that that world has benefited, the world that the U.S. led and created after the Second World War was to the enormous benefit of not only um, the rest of the world, but also to the United States itself. And, and historically, the U.S. has played this role, and our, you're absolutely correct in that our allies and partners in Europe, in East Asia, in, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, have looked to the United States for leadership um, consistently during the post-war period. The question, and I think you're, you're phrasing it the, the correct way, the question now is, is the U.S. still seen in that light? And I think that, that is, it, it is uh, framed appropriately. It is a question, as in, uh, are we still that reliable partner? I think the answer is right now, the world wants us to be that reliable partner. They, they want us to step up. They want us to lead. Uh, and the question is, will we do so? Um, Thus far, the United States is not doing particularly well when it comes to handling the pandemic in terms of number of cases, number of fatalities, sadly. Um, and, you know, not only are we going to be able to be looked at in terms of how we're going to uh, handle this problem going forward in terms of the uh, public health fallout, the economic fallout, but also critically the, um, you know, what are we going to be doing on the, on the foreign affairs front? Uh, and in my mind, it is a question. Uh, are we going to go uh, continue to go and bolster our uh, historic leadership position, or are we going to be going in another direction where we uh, do not um, take up the mantle of leadership? To me, that is the central question that we face. Um, so that was almost sort of a conversation, I think, a little bit that was happening b even before the coronavirus, as, you know, President Trump continued to sort of um, push his America first agenda. And there was always a concern that where there's a vacuum, another country will slip in, particularly China. China had this major setback with the coronavirus, but they've turned the corner. And we find ourselves increasingly dependent on them, particularly for medical supplies. Is there a possibility that China really benefits from this? Sure. So there is, um, my, my co-author and I, for this Atlantic Council report that we just published, uh, which creates three scenarios, one of those scenarios is essentially a China-first scenario, 
where, where, where the outcome is, as you described, where China uh, recovers faster uh, and it manages to um, look better in, in, in the eyes of the world compared to the U.S. and its European historic uh, European allies. So that China, uh, its economic recovery is, is quicker than ours. Uh, it, but also it goes um, on, a, on a foreign affairs uh, offensive, if you will, in terms of trying to tie other countries uh, closer into its orbit relative to what the U.S. And, and Europe are able to do, or I should say not able to do in, that, in this particular scenario, wherein we struggle economically, we, uh, Europe struggles economically, uh, and we don't step up to, um, to engage in our own, if you will, uh, offensive around cooperating and coordinating with other parts of the world. So yes, to answer your question, it is, it is entirely plausible that China may actually come out stronger relative to the United States um, than uh, before the pandemic, than before the pandemic, pandemic hit. And that is a real risk. So I guess, Peter, uh, what's the most likely scenario here? Uh, is there a hope? I, and I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange question to ask, but I'm just trying to understand if uh, that you see that through the rubble, just as you pointed out after World War II and the rubble of that horrific war that took millions of lives, here we are once again faced with a global threat. Um, and a lot of it is going to depend on measures that are taken, uh, not just to ensure the safety and security of citizens in a, in a particular state or country, but to ensure the safety of citizens all around the world, because people travel and people uh, uh, move between borders. Uh, so how do you see it all playing out? And I guess the question becomes, uh, are you hopeful about that scenario? Well, I think we need to be hopeful at this time. I mean, there, there, I don't want to minimize what we're facing. There is almost no one left in, alive on, uh, on Earth who um, uh, survived or, or was alive, I should say, at, at the time of the last truly global pandemic, which was the Spanish flu of 1918-19. And, and none of those people, frankly, will remember it because they were would have been very, very young. Um, it, it, is, it is important to stay hopeful amidst all of this. Uh, and it's important to stay hopeful because although there is real downside risk that this pandemic is going to do create a lot of economic dislocation, certainly the public health effects are, are um, severely consequential, including mortality. Um, and, and there is real geopolitical risk as well. And by geopolitical risk, I mean a fracturing of global alliances, a fracturing of global um, partnerships, and up to and including the possibility of, of conflict amongst major powers. Um, but uh, by the same token, the reason why we wrote our, our report, again, we have three scenarios of that in, in there. Two of those are negative, and one of, the, one of them is positive. And the positive one is a message that the Atlantic Council, my institution, um, consistently reinforces in, in, in everything we do because we believe in, in it, which is that um, cooperation is better than not cooperating. Cooperating is better than not cooperating. And uh, the, the world needs U.S. leadership. It needs leadership of the U.S. in concert with not only its allies and partners, again, historically, the, uh, Europe, historically, um, some East Asian countries and, and um, some in the, in the uh, Pacific Basin and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, but also, it need, we need to be working alongside um, those countries that we don't necessarily define as allies, so we might even define as rivals, uh, including China in order to get to a more cooperative uh, world, future world, one in which not only are we, ad we addressing the sources of the pandemic, so for example, we're eliminating sources of future pandemic risk, but we're also beginning to address other kinds of, of real systematic risks in the international system, including, for example, climate change and other kinds of, of, of um, risks that we know are on the horizon and that we know are coming, but that, and that will require true coordinated efforts to solve. So there is a hopeful scenario that we, we do paint, which, which we call the new renaissance, wherein the United States and um, the leadership um, bolstered by an American public that wants so, uh, global solutions, we do pick up that mantle, we do lead alongside our allies and partners, we do work with China to address a host of questions on the medical front, i.e. the public health front, the economic front, the economic recovery front, I should say, uh, and in a variety of other ways in order to not only lift all the boats of all of the major three um, sort of poles of the world, which are the East Asian and, and Chinese pole, the European pole, and the, and the North American or U.S. pole, but the rest of the world, too, including the global south. And so we do paint a very hopeful scenario. But in, in order for that to happen, that will require 
leadership from the United States. I, there is no substitute for the United States still in this world that we inhabit. Um, and and I, we, we think that um, there is a way out of this, but um, it's going to require some vision. It's going to require some willingness to engage. Uh, and, um, you know, I guess, again, going back to what we started the, this conversation with, the question is, is the United States prepared to do that? It's an excellent question, uh, and I guess we, it's to be continued. Uh, but we enjoyed having this conversation. Uh, Peter, Peter Engelke, thank you very much. Thank you both. I appreciate you having me on. Suddenly, it seems everything around us has been turned upside down. What can people use in terms of their faith in order to get through these very difficult times? The main thing is you're not standing there alone. And our new normal is something we're all trying to figure out. 10,000 people with medical experience have stepped up to volunteer. So we're saying we're all in this together. It's incredible, Mola. Now, we need a place to turn to. Dr. Jerome Adams, how soon could we have a therapeutic in the hands of our caregivers? For answers. Should we be advising people to wear masks? Great question. Truth. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. Let's get to that urgent situation aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And to make sense of our world. We're all trying to learn something during this crisis. We're all in this together. You got to help each other out, no matter what. He's got it right. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Multiple to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. As hospitals across the country focus on tackling this pandemic, people with other illnesses are left waiting in fear. A lot of people are avoiding going to the hospital or they're choosing to get treatment at alternative outpatient facilities. So we want to talk about that. We're going to bring in Dr. Ryan Lamb. Uh, doctor, you're an emergency medical physician in North Carolina. And, uh, you know, I can totally understand why people would want to avoid going to hospitals. And, and often they're being told to sort of, you know, if you don't need, even before, if you don't need to go to the emergency room, don't. But I think there's even a concern about going to urgent care facilities or even maybe going to some of these uh, testing facilities to maybe get some routine tests you had scheduled because who else is showing up there to get tests? So my first question for you is just advice for people who think they need some sort of medical intervention, but they're afraid to go to the ER. Um, yeah, my, my first uh, recommendation is that I think <clears throat> we have gotten uh, to be very safe. Um, we've learned a lot in the virus over the last couple of months and learn that with both distancing and you know masks and washing our hands, we can protect people. So I think the emergency department is safe. We've been seeing patients for over a month and none of our staff has gotten uh, the coronavirus or uh, COVID-19. So I think that that's probably the most important message is that it is safe to come in and get seen. But if you're looking for alternatives, I think there is virtual care, there are urgent cares, um, and then of course the emergency department. Trying to decide when to go, I think, is a difficult message. And I think people are making the mistake sometimes of waiting too long and missing that critical timeline when we can make a very good intervention and help people. Hmm. So I guess perhaps uh, for a lot of Americans, uh, the, the perception was that our medical professionals like yourself are, are overworked and under pressure and straining because of the rise of this pandemic and where we are today. Um, so it's wonderful news to hear you say uh, at your hospital in your emergency room that everybody is, is safe and healthy. That's really, really wonderful. But that, does that also mean that 
your the system, and I know we're specifically talking about yours, but I guess overall the system has not been taxed by the pandemic because in places like New York City, it does certainly feel as if our medical professionals here are under enormous pressure. And perhaps the reason why the governor in this state uh, uh, suggested that people put off surgeries that are elective was to sort of relieve that pressure. But is that perhaps not the case across the country? I think that we needed to uh, slow everything down and to try to flatten the curve. Absolutely, that was an important process. Um, we also needed to slow the same thing. We slowed down elective surgeries here, um, and we got prepared for the worst. New York was certainly hit much harder than everyone else um, that, that we see, and a lot of condensed areas had the same problem. But now that we have slowed things down enough, the hospital systems and the emergency departments in general across the country are not overwhelmed, and in fact, seeing mostly 30 to 40 percent reduction in volumes. So we have plenty of capability of taking care of people. If we completely remove the processes that we've been doing, then we are going to see an escalation of patients and can run into the same problem again if we're not following the guidelines of distancing and wearing masks and washing our hands. But at this time, that's not the case. And we're seeing a lot more both All right, we want to take you to the White House, where President Trump is meeting with Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards as that state uh, extends its stay-at-home order. Let's take a listen. 1,090-plus individuals. So it is the first truly high-powered, randomized, placebo-controlled trial. It was an international trial involving multiple sites, not only in the United States, but in various countries throughout the world, including Germany, Denmark, Spain, Greece, the UK, et cetera. The primary endpoint was the time to recovery, namely the ability to be discharged. When you have a study like this, we have a data and safety monitoring board which looks at the data. And they are independent, so there's no prejudice on the part of the investigators because they're doing the trial or the drug is from a certain company. The Data and Safety Monitoring Board on Monday afternoon contacted me on April 27th, first on Friday, the week before, and then again on April 27th, and notified the study team, namely the multiple investigators who are doing the study throughout the world, that the data shows that remdesivir has a clear-cut, significant, positive effect in diminishing the time to recovery. This is really quite important for a number of reasons, and I'll give you the data. It's highly significant. If you look at the time to recovery being shorter in the remdesivir arm, it was 11 days compared to 15 days. And that's a p-value for the scientists who are listening of 0 0.001. So that's something that, although a 31 percent improvement, doesn't seem like a knockout 100%. It is a very important proof of concept because what it has proven is that a drug can block this virus. And I'll give you an example in a moment of why we think, looking forward, this is very optimistic. The mortality rate trended towards being better in the sense of less deaths in the remdesivir group, 8% versus 11% in the placebo group. It has not yet reached statistical significance, but the data needs to be further analyzed. The reason why we're making the announcement now is something that I believe people don't fully appreciate. Whenever you have clear-cut evidence that a drug works, you have an ethical obligation to immediately let the people who are in the placebo group know so that they could have access. And all of the other trials that are taking place now have a new standard of care. So we would have normally waited several days until the data gets further dot the I and cross the T. But the data are not going to change. Some of the numbers may change a little, but the, but the conclusion will not change. So uh, when I was looking at this data with our team the other night, it was reminiscent of 34 years ago in 1986 when we were struggling for drugs for HIV. And we had nothing. And there was a lot of anecdotal reports about things that maybe did work, maybe not. People were taking different kinds of drugs. And we did the first randomized placebo-controlled trial with AZT, 
which turned out to give an effect that was modest. But that was not the end game, because building on that every year after, we did better and better. We had better drugs of the same type, and we had drugs against different targets. This drug happens to be blocking a enzyme that the virus uses, and that's an RNA polymerase. But there are a lot of other enzymes that the virus uses that are now going to be targets for this. This will be the standard of care. And in fact, when we look at the other trials we're doing, we were going to do trial with another uh, 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 antiviral. Actually, it isn't an antiviral. It's an anti-inflammatory, uh, a monoclonal antibody. We're going to now compare the combination of remdesivir with this. So as drugs come in, we're going to see if we could add on that. So bottom line, uh, you're going to be hearing more details about this. This will be submitted to a peer-reviewed journal and will be peer-reviewed appropriately. But we think it's really a, a opening the door to the fact that we now have the capability of treating. And I can guarantee you, as more people, more companies, more investigators get involved, it's going to get better and better. So I'll stop there, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Does that make you more comfortable? Why don't you go first, and then you go. Does any of this data change the timeline and the development of a vaccination? No, no. no, this has nothing to do with vaccines. This is treatment for people who are already infected. Vaccines is to prevent infection in those who are at risk. Do you have new data on vaccines? No, nothing more than that. what I continue at the press conferences that we have regularly, keep you up to date, that everything is on track with the phase one study. We're in the third part of it. We're going to go into phase two in the summer. But nothing has changed that anything I've said when we had press conferences. Tony, they're writing a lot about Oxford. We know Johnson & Johnson yeah. is well advanced. That's another candidate, another one of several candidates that are moving along. Because we're going to have a lot of shots on goal when it comes to vaccines. Yeah. That's good. That's great. Yeah, please, go ahead. How does this news influence your thought process on states reopening their governments? Do you think people should be more comfortable uh, knowing that there is a drug that is proven effective? Well, I think it's a beginning. I thought Tony explained it really well. It's a beginning. It means you build on it. I love that as a building block. You know, just as a building block, I love that. But uh, certainly, it's a, it's a positive. It's a very positive event uh, from that standpoint. And uh, we're going to be very careful as we uh, open. A lot of people, a lot of governors are opening. Uh, I know you're very advanced. You're going to be very advanced in getting sure. it going. Uh, but uh, we're, going to, we're doing it very carefully. We've learned a lot over the last couple of months. And if there's a, uh, a fire, we're going to put it out. If there's a little ember burning, we're going to put it out. We're going to put it out very quickly. And uh, I think we've learned how to do that. There have been some areas that have uh, really started up, and we put it out very quickly. So we've learned a lot. Yeah, please. Mr. President, the, uh, the Stop the Spread guidelines expire tomorrow. Do you intend to extend those? Well, I'll let Mike. Uh, do you want to explain what we're doing on that? I think, uh, Mr. President, we've, uh, we've issued the guidelines. Now, it was actually 45 days ago, um, first 15 and then 30 days to slow the spread. Um, and uh, frankly, every state in America uh, has embraced those guidelines at a minimum or even done more. Um, and now our focus is working with states uh, as, as uh, governors like uh, Governor John Bell Edwards uh, uh, unveil plans to open up their states again. Um, and the new guidance that we've issued is guidance for how they can do that safely and responsibly. And so the, the, not only the gating criteria for when we believe it's appropriate for states to enter phase one are included, but also the very specific guidelines for when states open and how they can open in, a, in, as the president said, in a safe and responsible way are included in uh, the president's guidelines for open up America again. So the current guidelines then will not be extended after uh, the, tomorrow? The current guidelines, I think you can say, are very much incorporated in the guidance that we're giving states uh, to open up America again. But maybe, Mr. Yeah, President, and I Dr. think a Burks. way of saying it, well, they'll be fading out because now the governors are doing it. I've had many calls from governors, uh, governor of Texas, Greg Abbott, and many, many governors, uh, Tennessee, Arkansas. We're speaking to a lot of different people, and they're explaining what they're doing. And I'm, I am very much in favor of what they're doing. They're getting it going. And uh, we're opening our country again. Do you want to explain that, please? Yeah, I think you could see from California, they made 
slow the spread, the phase one of their four phases. So every governor is adapting both currently where we are and moving forward of how to move through phase one, phase two, phase three. So if a governor feels like they haven't met the grading criteria, some of them have made that their own first phase one, and some of them have made it phase zero. So we've been very encouraged to see how the federal guidelines have helped inform, or at least provide a framework for governors in moving forward all the way through from what they now call either phase zero all the way through phase three. And Ron DeSantis, as you know, Governor of Florida was here yesterday, and he gave, I thought, a really good presentation of how he's doing it, what he's doing, yeah. how he's opening. You might have seen it. I did. And he did a, a very good job, I thought, uh, Really you know, Mr. Good. President, I, I would say that if you look at the, the plan that UI had put out for 30 days to stop the spread, the mitigation measures that you promoted in that plan are carried forward in the right. guidelines for reopening. And so it's, it's, it's sort of a seamless way to do it by keeping those mitigation measures in, in place that you need to as you reopen, especially for the vulnerable population. Uh, so it's, it's really, I, I would agree with the Vice President that it is carried forward, uh, not just theoretically, but expressly in the document that you gave us. And I thank, and thank you. you for mentioning the vulnerable people because we've made it clear from over the last eight weeks that there was certain risk groups that were particularly vulnerable to serious disease. That has held up. We see in most of reports about 95 to 96 percent of the individuals with serious disease and hospitalizations are still in those groups. I think in a way that's reassuring, but it also should be a message to all of our vulnerable populations, as we have said for the last eight weeks in phase one and in phase two, as well as in slow the spread, we've been very clear about them continuing to shelter and those families protecting them from it becoming infected. Mr. President, what are you hoping to learn about uh, China and the World Health Organization with this investigation you've commissioned with the intelligence agencies? Right. It's coming in, and I'm getting pieces already. And we're not happy about it. And we are by far the largest contributor to WHO, World Health. And uh, they misled us. I don't know. They must have known more than they knew because they came after what other people knew that weren't even involved. We knew things that they didn't know, and either they didn't know or they didn't tell us. Or, uh, you know, right now they're, uh, they're literally a, a pipe organ for China. That's the way I view it. So um, we're seeing and we're looking and we're watching. And uh, again, we give. $500 million we have over the years, from 400 to 500 for a long time, for many years. And uh, China is giving $38 million. And yet, they seem to work for China. And they should have been in there early. They should have known what was going on. And they should have been able to stop it at the — you talk about stopping the spread or stopping the embers. That could have — that could have been stopped there. And then why did China allow planes to fly out, but not into China, but they allow planes to come out, and planes are coming out of Wuhan, and they're coming out — they're going all over the world. They're going to Italy, very, very big time to Italy, but they're going all over the world, but they're not going into China. What was that all about? So we had a — no, no, you we, you'll, you'll hear. Uh, we're coming up with a uh, very distinct recommendation, but we're not happy with it. We're not happy with it. Uh, even today, I, I've heard some statements that are very positive. There's nothing positive about what happened in China having to do with this subject. Nothing positive at all. And I finished uh, a number of months ago with a trade deal, and you would have thought it would have been like somebody would have said, hey, they could have stopped that at the source. They didn't have to let airplanes fly out and loads of people come out. And we're lucky, as Tony said, we're lucky that we stopped it in January, flowing into our country from China outside of our citizens. You know, people now say, oh, well, you shouldn't have let our citizens back in. Uh, let's, uh, let's forget about that one. Uh, we're lucky we stopped in January. A lot of people, long after that date, as you know, thought that the uh, measure that I took was much too strong. John Bell, we're lucky we stopped it then. You know, we, we, put a, we put a border, we put a ban on people coming in from China. So uh, we'll have a recommendation pretty soon, but we are not happy with the World Health Organization. But just that to I clarify, guess. a recommendation on what? On, on the World Health Organization or a recommendation on China? What on do you mean? World Health with China to follow. Mr. Mr. President. Can I ask a question of, of Dr. Fauci? Um, 
There was also a study out of China uh, of remdesivir uh, that came out today that didn't find a significant statistical significance with the treatment. I'm wondering if you saw that. It was a Lancet study and, and why that. Yeah, it's an underpowered like study, and it was, I mean, it's not the kind of study where, that's the reason why I was very explicit in saying this is a randomized control, placebo controlled trial that's powered to the tune of over a thousand in hospitalized patients. And the endpoint was a clear endpoint the time that you essentially are discharged and the secondary endpoint to death. So even though, I mean, I don't like to poo poo other studies, but that's not an adequate study, and everybody in the field feels that. Mr. President, what can you do to help businesses with liability issues as workers come back? in states that have opened up? Well, as you know, we just uh, worked with the meat processors, and if you think about it, a form of delivery. Uh, we have tremendous product. We have ample supply. But there was a uh, bottleneck caused by this whole uh, pandemic, and it was pretty — it was potentially pretty serious. And I just got off the phone with the biggest in the world — I mean, the biggest distributors there are, and the big companies that you've been reading about. They are so thrilled. They're so happy. Uh, they're all gung-ho, and we solved their problems. We unblocked some of the bottlenecks. And I'm sure you've seen it. You've, I'm sure you've heard. Uh, I, I spoke to him about two hours ago, signed something very important last night in terms of Defense Production Act. Uh, and uh, it was very important. They were, they were so happy. They're, they're like — it's like a new business. They were, they were being very unfairly treated, very unfairly treated. So uh, the farmers are very happy, and the ranchers, and the, uh, the companies that we're talking about, uh, you know the ones I'm talking about, because they're all — they've all become very well-known. They were well-known anyway. They're big companies, but they're now being treated fairly. They're, they're thrilled. And that whole uh, bottleneck is broken up. So the Defense Production Act protects them well, from Well, we use it. That's what we did. We used it. And it, it helps them greatly, greatly, to do what they have to do. Because they're ready to do it, but they — they needed some help. How do you protect the workers, though, in those plants? What are you doing to protect Well, we're them? doing that. We're going to have a report on that probably this afternoon. We're going to have a good form of protection. And uh, through quarantine, when we find somebody that's uh, not — we're going to be very — they're going to be very careful. They are — as to who's going into the plant. And uh, the quarantine is going to be very strong. And we're going to make people better when they have a problem. We're going to get them better. Hopefully, they're going to get better. You know, we have a very good record of — having people getting better. A lot of people don't talk about that, John Bell, where uh, people go in statistically, but you don't read about the tremendous success we've had. We've had uh, — we're just about number one in the world in terms of success. Germany's doing well. We're doing well. A couple of countries are doing okay, but we're doing very well. So the, the statistics are very good on that. So we're going to — we're going to get them better. Yes, Steve? Just a quick follow-up to Dr. Fauci. When might we see remdesivir on the market? How, how yeah. soon might we see that? Well, right now, it's happening that the FDA, literally as we speak, is working with Gilead to figure out mechanisms to make this easily available to those who need it. Uh, with regard to getting to the market, will obviously have to be approved by the FDA for licensure. And the FDA is very well aware that this is something that is very important. So I'm sure they're going to be moving very expeditiously. But I can't give you a date. Right. Tony, would this be used in the earlier phases or in the late well, phases? Yeah, this — and uh, thank you for that question, because there are a lot of different permutations. This is in hospitalized patients, and the endpoint was the time to discharge. So it's unclear yet right now from this study whether or not it would be better for early. We don't know. It could be. But we only make statements about what we've proven. And the only thing that's been proven now is in hospitalized patients. So good question, but we don't have the answer. Thank you. Mr. President, fiscally speaking, um, GDP shrinks 4.8 percent. Curious your reaction on that, and what, if anything, you want to see of another possible stimulus package? So, if you look at what's going on in the market, where the market's at 24,000, and this came from us blind. We never knew. We had the greatest economy ever in the world, in the history of the world. We had the best economy. I say it openly. Nobody even challenges it. And they would if they thought I was wrong. We had the best economy ever, and we're going to have it again. What happened is, uh, look at the market today, 24,000, above 24,000, I think, uh, Kevin. In fact, I'll ask you to say a couple of things about that. But uh, if you would have said that we would have had the worst pandemic since 1917, over 100 years ago, with the disturbance uh, to, to 184 countries at least, because that was as of last week, 
and that a market would be we're at 29,000 and now we're going to be at 24,000. And we were at a low. I think we're having one of the best weeks. We're having one of the best periods in terms of stock market, which to me is jobs and future. I don't view it as a stock. I view it as jobs and future. If you would have said to me that we'd be at 24,000 and we, you know, it's uh, we started off at a, when I was elected, the number was much lower, much, much lower, as you know. It's called in the teens. But if you would have said we would have been at 24,000 with what we've gone through as a country, John Bell, it's pretty amazing. And I think I read where this is one of the best weeks in the stock market this last short period of time that we've had in uh, since the 1950s or 1940s. So uh, I think there's a tremendous feeling of optimism in this country. I can only say that there's going to be a tremendous feeling of optimism. I think the third quarter is transitional. It's a it, we're, we're transiting into, but it's a very transitional period. I think it's going to do good, but I think the fourth quarter is going to be fantastic. I think next year, all of the fruits of what we've all done together between the doctors and the business people and yourself, thank you very much. Of course, you're a doctor. But all of the work from the task force, all of the people that have worked so hard, uh, it, we're going to have a tremendous year next year. And uh, you're going to start to see that, I think, in the fourth quarter, maybe even in pieces of the third quarter. But that's, again, very transitional. Mr. President, spending, though, uh, is there a day of reckoning coming with over $2 trillion spending? No, it's about growth. It's about growth. We're going to be in great shape because we're growing. And we could have done it the other way. You don't spend anything and you're flat for years. You know, there, there are ways of looking at it. We, you have to throw money at it. But we're throwing money at the people that lost their job unfairly. You saw some of the people yesterday in the White House where they were, they were down and out and we came along and helped them. So we could have been flat for a long time as a country, or we could grow. I think you're going to see tremendous growth. It's a stimulus, and it's, it's, a, it's a great stimulus. Now they want more stimulus, uh, and they're pushing for things, though. But uh, I don't know that we should be working with states that have been suffering for uh, — through bad leadership or bad management for 25 years, and I'm, we're supposed to fix that. So we're going to have to talk about that. President, Maybe they should have brought that up sooner. Captain Crozier, would you like to see him return uh, as I think he's a I, — I don't know him. I've never spoken to him. I think he's a very, very good man uh, who had a very bad day. And then he wanted to be Ernest Hemingway. You know, he starts writing long memos. You can't do that when you're a captain of a ship, especially that ship. That's the, that's the ultimate nuclear aircraft carrier, the best in the world, 5,000 crew members, and uh, he decides to become Ernest Hemingway. You can't do that. You can't do that. With that being said, I, I said, he just had, he had a bad day. We all have bad days. Secretary Nisper asked for your advice on how to proceed. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to comment, but I have my feelings on it. And I just think he's a very good man who had a bad, and I think the acting secretary is a very good man also. And he had a bad day. They both had bad days. You want to know the truth? They both had bad days. And that can happen. Uh, they were under a lot of pressure because it went very public. And uh, so they'll be uh, seeing me at a certain point. But I think he's a very good man. I think they're both very good men. But, you know, when you talk about spreading, so it started with two people, then it went to 12 people, then it went to — I got a report yesterday. It was 851 people. Now, they have 5,000 people. So it starts with a little group, and then a few — a few weeks later, how long is that? Four weeks. 800 and some odd people. And uh, they're sailors. They're young. They're, there is one death, as you know. There's one death. There's about 10 people in the hospital right now. But they'll be — we expect all, all to get better. But there is one death out of it. But uh, that spread like wildfire, right? Think of that. You know, it was 2 and 12, and then you — we thought it ended at 41. You didn't think so. I don't no. think you thought so, right? The, 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 just the right environment for spread like yeah. that. It, it, was a, it was a tough environment. Mr. President, Mr. President, on testing yesterday, you said that we will very soon be testing 5 million people. Well, I don't know where it came up. Yeah. You said that. I, I'd like to refer to these two people, because I don't know where it came up. Everyone kept saying, you said there'd be five. 
That was a study that came out. Somebody came out with a study of 5 million people. Do I think we will? I think we will, but I never said it. We're testing millions of people. We're testing more people than anyone, any country in the world by far, by double, by much more than double, more than everybody else combined we're testing. But somebody started throwing around 5 million. I didn't say 5 million. Somebody said 5 million. I think it might have been the Harvard report. There was a report from Harvard, and they said 5 million. Well, we will be there, but I didn't say it. I mean, I didn't say it, but somebody came out with a report saying 5 million. It sounds like a lot. Yesterday, I looked at Deborah. I said, what's with the 5 million? I think that was from the Harvard report. But we are going to be there at a certain point. We'll be there, but we're we're more advanced than any country in the world on testing. And not only that, the testing is the best test. Not only the most. We've not only done the most. Even when you look at so many people, they love the Abbott Laboratories test. You might have had it. Did you have it today? Yes, sir, Good. I did. He's Thank okay. You. you got a test out of this deal. <laughs> I did. But everybody comes in, and they give them the test. In five minutes, they know they're okay or they're not okay. So far, we haven't found anyone not okay. But uh, it's a great test. But we, that was not even — nobody even thought of that two months ago or three months ago. You know, that was developed over a very short period of time, brilliantly developed by Abbott. So, uh, no, we'll be at whatever number it is, but we're so far advanced over any and, — and, you know, it would be really good if the press would give credit for it to the people that have done such a good job, because they're always saying, well, you know, you're doing millions, but what about five million? I'm saying, where did that number — I keep asking, where does it come from? I really learned this morning — I think it was probably the Harvard uh, said that that would be nice. It'll and be sure, it would be nice, and we'll be there. But, but again, we didn't say it. Who said it is a report. We have other reports talking about a much lower number. But we're doing better than anybody in the world by far. The people that have worked on it have been incredible. And, uh, you know, John Bell is testament to it. Testing is one of the great reasons that you've been successful in Louisiana. Yes, sir. It, with a lot of help uh, from, from our federal partners. And the best news that we got as a state, quite frankly, and all states got it, was on Monday when Admiral Girard said that our plans had all been received last Wednesday and they were going to be able to resource the testing kits. Yeah. So I don't know about $5 million for the country, but Louisiana is going to do our part with 200000 per month. And I think if you extrapolate that out, that comes close to five yeah. million. I don't, I don't Pretty know, much, but yeah. I don't know what time period you're talking yeah. about. Admiral Girard said to Time Magazine that five million tests per day is simply not possible. Do you agree with that? So what we have talked about and what was in the blueprint um, in talking with states, and you can see, I mean, this is Louisiana's curve. They got to this curve of mitigation and containment across the state with about. Um, 26,000 tests per million, or about um, 26, yeah, 26,000 tests per million, so million of their population. So these tests, and I've been very clear about it, these are RNA tests, which means you take the virus out of there in your nose, you've got to crack the virus open, extract out the RNA, amplify the RNA, and then get an answer. And you can see that's happening inside a machine. Sometimes um, lab directors and lab technicians have to, have to physically mix all of those reagents. That's when you hear about extraction reagents and why they're needed. And so what, what we had in the blueprint is really a call to action to really work on developing antigen tests like we use for flu. Because when you're using an antigen test in a doctor's office, then you can get to potentially that number. I'm not sure we need that number. I don't want to validate that number, but I'm saying is with this current test and the complication of how it has to be run, that's not physically possible. And I think that's what Admiral Girard was speaking to. But we've, as we talked about ID now, we continue to develop more testing and different platforms. But I think we do need that kind of new breakthrough to a new technique, a new measurement to get to the kind of numbers that Harvard's talking about. But I think we've made it clear all along that states have controlled and mitigated with the current number. And as you heard from the governor, he didn't shut everything down. There was still, he has a curve like this with still a significant number of Louisianans working. So I think what every governor is working on is how do I get the most people I can back to work and still maintain high level of safety? And I think what's the roadmap and the criteria and the testing come together to create that. This will not be a testing alone piece. And as you just heard about the Roosevelt 
and I bring this up every time, this asymptomatic spread will be important. And we just heard about 800 cases, 10 or less than 10 in the hospital or 10 to 15 in the hospital, 800, 10 or 15 in the hospital. If you're only diagnosing symptomatic cases, you may be missing a large part of the spread. And I think that's why strategically using testing in a new way, a monitoring way, a monitoring way to proactively find asymptomatic individuals, particularly when they surround our most vulnerable groups, whether it's Native Americans or long-term care facilities. We want governors to simultaneously work on finding the cases, as they did so superbly, and then work on a proactive measurement to find the asymptomatic cases. And I think those two pieces have to come together. And I think that's what's in the blueprint. That's what we're having the calls with the states with um, and really see how do we effectively use our current testing capacity to ensure we're both monitoring and diagnosing. And you know what's interesting about that number is that uh, I remember when we did a million, we said, we just did a million. And the media said, oh, when are you going to do two million? I said, uh, soon, pretty soon, then we do two million. And then they said, when are you going to do five million? In other words, it's sort of a setup, because no matter what, and by the way, when we hit five million, when are we going to hit 10 million? It's a little bit of a trap. You know, it's called the media trap. It pertains to me, it doesn't pertain to other people, but it's what I've had to experience for five years. That it is well, I don't know. I heard the five million is totally unnecessary. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to hit it pretty easily. But I, I, again, I think it's a media trap. I think the number, um, you know, I, I've just, all I know is this. President Moon of South Korea, because we've heard a lot of good things about South Korea, have good relationship. He called me to congratulate me on the testing. He said, your testing is the greatest in the world. How did this happen? I kept hearing about South Korea, South Korea. and. He said, I want to just tell you that what you've done with testing is incredible, okay? So our people should be congratulated. And what they'll do is, no matter what, if we test, as they say, 325 million people, they're going to say, when are you going to test them twice, okay? So, you know, it's a trap. It's really a media trap, but, but that's okay. Look. We are better than anybody in the world on testing. We have tested more than anybody in the world, and we have the best tests in the world. And that's been all developed over the last couple of months, because we started off with nothing. We had nothing. We had absolutely nothing. Uh, and that included ventilators, and that included, uh, I always say, the cupboards were bare. Uh, they were bare in the military, and they were bare medically, in terms of pandemics or epidemics or whatever you want to call it. So uh, our people have done an incredible job. Yeah. Mr. President, uh, concerning WHO, do you think that China is playing a better game in terms of soft power? Say it again. Uh, do you think that China is playing a better game in terms of influence soft power in the w WHO? Well, they've been doing it for years, and they play the game. And I guess we've had people over the years that never really focused on that game. You know, who would think you'd have to play the game? Uh, and it's to a large extent, public relations, you know, public relations or whatever. Uh, but China's not to be congratulated for what happened, just so you understand it. They're not to be congratulated for what took place. And WHO is essentially congratulating them. And when they start doing that, we've got problems. And again, the United States pays almost 500 million, and they pay 38 million a year. 500 million versus 38 million a year. So there are lots of different people that we can give this to. You know, we can give this money to lots of different incredible groups. There are a lot of groups out there. It doesn't have to go to the WHO. We can give it to groups that are very worthy and get much more bang for your buck. But we're going to make a decision in the not-too-distant future. If I could, I'd just like to have John Bell finish up by uh, talking about the great success in Louisiana. And you worked with our two great senators, and they were Absolutely. really uh, — John and Bill, and, and they were really uh, calling me a lot and saying, we got to take care of Louisiana. So you had a great relationship with them. We did. I know Senator Kennedy worked on the respira — I'm sorry, the ventilator issue. And Senator Cassidy and I were — last night were talking about uh, testing uh, and what we can do going forward with the blueprint, because uh, he and Dr. Redfield had, had discussed that. 
Um, but, but we've obviously turned the corner in Louisiana. We're in a much, much better place than we thought was even possible five or six Correct. weeks ago, I, I will tell you. And, and that's because of our local partners and our federal partners and, and hard work. We've had a lot of lessons to learn because there's no blueprint for this. There's a blueprint for testing now, but there's no blueprint for a governor. How do you respond to, to a pandemic? Uh, so we've, we've had a steep learning curve, but I will tell you we're in a, we're in a much better place. Uh, the, the field medical stations that you provided, the, the Navy uh, medical personnel that you sent to Louisiana, uh, the testing that we had early was the key, and that has informed our testing strategy uh, going forward, and we're excited about the opportunity to have the test kits that we need allocated uh, starting in the month of May to get to the 200,000. We'll, we'll do uh, 43 persons per 1,000. That's what we're going to get to That's in Louisiana, oh. and, we, and we're going to we're going to be in, in much better uh, shape after that, Mr. President. We look forward to getting past this, returning to a newer sense of normalcy, uh, which I don't think will come officially and uh, fully until we get the vaccine. Um, but we look we're looking forward to moving. Uh, to, we're looking forward to moving ahead and and just appreciate your work and, and your, your contributions to our efforts. It's been very helpful. Well, it's an honor working with you Thank and you, the sir. people of Louisiana. Great people. They yes, put. Sir. They've really gone through a lot. Well, I'll just say they're the best. <laughs> I'll tell you what, they're right there. I agree. They're, they're great people. Do you feel like you have enough test kits and supplies to run as many tests as you think you need? Well, what I believe is that with the commitments that were made this past Monday by Admiral Girard, uh, that, that having looked at all 50 state plans for testing going forward, that they've, they've committed to resourcing Louisiana's request for 200,000 test kits per month. That gets us to 43 out of each out of every thousand uh, tested every month. We believe that that's sufficient for us to move forward uh, as we are able uh, to start reopening the economy. We know the lab capacity is there. Uh, we have Dr. B.U. here with me. He's done a phenomenal job. He's responsible in large measure for that curve coming down. And so we feel pretty good at that level. And, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to be able to come up here today at the president's invitation to thank him for that commitment because this, I'm only speaking for myself, but having been part of all the calls with the governors, this is the big piece that, that we've been looking for. And with that commitment, we really feel much better about going forward. That's great. Great job. Would you like to say something, Doctor? No, we're, we're, uh, we know the importance of testing. We can't treat what we don't uh, find. And early on, we, we knew that we had a problem and we knew that we needed to surge our testing. And so we were grateful uh, to have that support, especially in the epicenter uh, in New Orleans, in the, in the uh, parishes right around there so that we could get a sense of, of what's going on with COVID. And then we've continued that pattern through the rest of the state. Well, it's, uh, it's been great. And all of that is coming. Everything went, and now it's coming. And uh, you'll be in a, a position. I think you said 43. That's a big number. That's a great number. Sure. If you could do that, that would be a fantastic number. Uh, one thing I think I'd like to just finish by saying, so we reached a million cases. And uh, that's, a, that's a tremendous amount. And the reason is because of testing, because other countries don't test. So you, if you don't test, you're not going to find cases. The reason we have a million, uh, take a look at number two. Number two is a, a fraction of that, because they don't test. They, they don't have the ability to do what we're doing. So it's a number that, in one way, sounds bad, but in another way is really actually uh, an indication that our testing is so superior. I mean, to think that we have uh, more people more cases than China. Does anybody really believe that? But the testing is different. And, and I think also the transparency is much different. You, transparency is like from day and night. We are totally transparent, whatever it is, it is. But because of our great testing and because of what we've done and the amount we've done, we uh, are able to point out far more cases than anybody else has. Uh, if other countries did the kind of testing that we had, now, we're a much bigger country than most also in terms of people, but if other countries did this kind of testing, you'd see numbers that would be much different. Okay? Thank you all very much. All right, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Much. President, how essential is it to you that these states wait 14 days? Come on, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. 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 These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. 
you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Thinking. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay 1800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. In times of uncertainty... Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this, we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers... Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease, or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. I want to take you live to New Jersey. Governor Phil Murphy is giving us an update on coronavirus. He just announced a short time ago that in his state of New Jersey, golf courses and parks will reopen starting this Saturday. Let's listen in. Expanding access to testing is among our highest priorities, and we've gone as a nation from being completely uh, unprepared in New Jersey from a standing start to now testing, I think, the third or fourth highest most tested state in America. Uh, it's among our highest priorities as a robust uh, and, and accessible testing program is not only a need for the here and now, but a need for us as we discussed on our road to recovery. Uh, it's in incredibly important as we restart our economy. And in this, we are continually seeking ways to maximize our partnerships with Rutgers University, by example, with our private labs and with our federal partners to reach our goal. Remember, public health creates economic health. That is the order, that is the mantra, that is what guides us. And having a strong testing program in place is critical for us to ensure the former so that we can ensure together the latter. Now, before I hand things over to Judy, I want to continue our practice of giving credit where it is due and highlighting some of the ordinary New Jerseyans doing extraordinary things that are helping us get through this emergency. I just looked today, and I don't have a, a slide for this, but uh, I just looked at the calls of thanks that I had made and texts of thanks I had made to our brothers and sisters in organized labor uh, and just added up what's been going on over the past just number of days um, to, the, to the painters and the, in, in their allied trades. Vinnie Lane and his team at District Council 71 donating a couple of thousand face masks. Uh, today, I heard from Rich Tolson, the Bricklayers Union are, are giving money to several of the hardest hit hospitals. The uh, IBEW brothers and sisters have come forward, uh, as always, in our hour of need, and it's just extraordinary to my friend Dan Costner and, and his brothers and sisters at IBEW 351, uh, to Rob Shimko and Eric Hotelling at, 
IBEW Local 400, to Wayne D'Angelo and Steve Aldridge at IBEW 269, uh, to Joe Egan, our dear friend at IBEW 456, and all of his uh, brothers and sisters. It just sort of goes on and on and on. And if that weren't enough, I looked down today and saw that our assemblyman Roy Fryman has donated himself a pallet of Lysol spray and a pallet of Lysol wipes to the state police. Um, so God bless each and every one of them. Uh, let's, let's come up with a, a picture of a guy who lives not too far from me. First up is Bobby Hoy. There's Bobby. He's a senior at Rumson Fairhaven Regional High School, where he was also captain, by the way, of the track team. Bobby was training for what would have been his first marathon, the New Jersey Marathon, which was scheduled for this past Sunday. But why, why let all that training go to waste, Bobby concluded. He decided to run his marathon anyway, in his home, on a treadmill, and to use it as an opportunity to ask friends and family to pledge money to support Jersey Shore University Medical Center's COVID-19 relief fund. He enlisted the help of his friend and fellow senior Peyton Ming to help live stream his run. In five hours and 25 minutes and 16 seconds and nearly $6,000 later, Bobby finished his marathon. He didn't get a finisher's medal, unfortunately, but he has our deepest admiration and respect for an extraordinary accomplishment. And for anyone who's ever run uh, one, two, or three miles on a treadmill, as I have on many occasions, that's hard enough. Can you imagine running 26.2 of them? And he did it. So to you, Bobby Hoy, and assist to Peyton Ming, congratulations. New Jersey thanks you, and go Bulldogs. Next, I have to give a shout out to one of North Jersey's true, truly iconic restaurants, Nanina's in the Park, a place many of us have probably been many times. I think many for me would be measured in the hundreds. Nanina's, along with the Park Chateau and the Park Savoy, are owned by Joe and Barry Murillo, dear friends, and Vito Cucci. Pulling their staffs and resources together, they have been catering roughly 2,000 meals a week for workers at St. Barnabas Medical Center, Clara Mass Medical Center, and the Morristown Medical Center. They're also getting meals to local police and have made a donation, if that weren't enough, to Hackensack Meridian Health as well. So Joe, Barry, and Vito, thank you. You represent the tremendous spirit that we've seen from so many business owners across our state who have been stepping up to support our front lines. To, so to them and the entire team at Nanina's, New Jersey thanks you. And I know the hungry folks on our front, front lines especially thank you. And that's as good a place as any to finish. If you have someone in your community stepping up, we want to know about it. Tell us their story on social media and use the hashtag NJ thanks you. These stories are giving us hope and optimism for the better days we know will come. And we can hasten their arrival if we keep doing what I know millions of you are already doing, keeping up with your social distancing, washing your hands, and staying at home. And may I just say this about the parks. We're going to be looking very, very closely up and down the state this weekend. I'm happy at one level that we're able to take this step, but we will enforce this. And if we don't like what we see, I hate to say this, I reserve the right to reverse the executive order that I'm signing today. So please enjoy the parks, but stay away from each other. Do not congregate. Wear a face covering. Be responsible. If we have a good weekend this weekend, that hopefully can lead to better days ahead. We can keep these parks open. And again, we're going to win this. We will get there, I promise you. And we'll get there together. Let's do this. We're one New Jersey family. And remember, we're New Jersey. Nobody can touch us. With that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persa Kelly. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. We are getting reports that individuals in the state may be delaying the needed health care that they require. So today, the New Jersey Hospital Association President, Kathleen Bennett, and I will be filming a public service announcement to remind the public that if you're experiencing signs and symptoms that could be a heart attack or a stroke or unrelenting abdominal or back pain, you should not delay in seeking care. Call 911 and go to your nearest emergency room. Slurred speech, muscle weakness, hip or back pain requiring opioids or 
chest discomfort, lightheadedness, are symptoms to take seriously and to act upon. Yes, we know this is an unprecedented pandemic that we're faced with, and I know that people may be fearful, wondering, is it safe to go to the hospital? Are they ready? Is there room for me? They're so busy. Will I be taken care of? Well, I've worked in hospitals for the entire of my career, and I can assure you that our hospitals and our emergency rooms are safe and waiting. They are waiting and ready to care for you. Our hospitals have been safe havens for all of you who have walked through their doors for over a century. Open 24-7, 365 days a year, they are always available to everyone. So I urge you, do not delay going to your local emergency room if you are experiencing signs and symptoms of a heart attack or stroke, face drooping, arm weakness or numbness, slurred speech or difficulty speaking, sudden confusion or trouble seeing may be signs of an impending stroke, chest pain or pressure, pain or discomfort in arms, back, neck, jaw or stomach, shortness of breath, nausea or lightheadedness may be signs of a heart attack. So every minute counts when experience, experiencing a heart attack or a stroke. So please do not delay seeking care. Don't delay. It may save your life. Amen. Last evening, our hospitals reported 6,289 hospitalizations of COVID-19 positive patients or those under investigation. And 1,811 of those individuals are in critical care with 73% on ventilators. Last evening, only two hospitals in the state, and they were in the central region, went on divert. One hospital was on full divert, and one hospital was on divert for specialty services only. Today, as the governor shared, we're reporting 2,481 new cases for a total of 116, 264 cases in the state. And I'm, I'm sad to share that there have been 329 new deaths for a total of 6,770 fatalities. The breakdown of deaths by race and ethnicity is as follows. White, 52.3%. Black, 20.1%. Hispanic, 16.9%. Asian, 5.1%. And other, 5.5%. There are 489 long-term care facilities in the state reporting at least one case of COVID-19. That is a total of 18,045 cases in our long-term care and assisted living facilities. At the state veteran homes, among the census of 704 residents, there have been 274 residents that tested positive for a total of 104 deaths of residents. 45 at the Menlo Park facility and 59 at the Paramus facility. Universal testing of residents and staff is taking place. And yesterday in Menlo Park, they started and it should be completed today or tomorrow. At our state psychiatric hospitals, 157 patients have tested positive and there have been nine deaths as I have previously reported. According to lab data, uh, as of this morning, uh, labs have reported 216, 216 221 tests performed, 91,167 have returned positive for a positivity rate of 42.16%. So that includes my daily report. Stay connected, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Judy, thank you. The positivity, again, to underscore that, that's an important data point I know you and Christina look at, and that is as low as it's been in a while. Uh, and again, remember, we still are testing overwhelmingly, not entirely, but overwhelmingly symptomatic folks, right? Yes. As a county matter, which I always uh, tr try to follow up in terms of positive cases, it's the same six counties that have <clears throat> the most cases, Bergen followed by Hudson, Essex, Union, Passaic, and Middlesex. But if you look at the cases that we announced today, uh, the top three counties in order are Passaic, Middlesex, and Essex. So the Middlesex was in there both yesterday and today, and it gives you some sense of the migration uh, of things. 
And I thought we were, you and I, Judy, along with Sheila Oliver and the Attorney General were on last night with um, a good uh, group of uh, black legislative leadership, uh, other county uh, African-American leadership, other organizations, um, Institute for Social Justice, uh, Reverend Boyer and, and his colleagues. I thought it was a, a very good discussion, but the fact of the matter is the, the African-American fatality number continues to be bouncing. It's a little less than 50% now, but it's still meaningfully above the representation in the whole of New, New Jersey, and that's something that um, the Lieutenant Governor Judy and I spoke to that concerns us that we're focused on not just in the near term, but also as we're on that road to recovery, we mentioned that important pillar of resiliency. Part of that is to make sure we don't see that, uh, we don't see the, this, um, the, the, the disparities that we're seeing, particularly as it relates to communities of color. Um, and so that was, I thought it was a good discussion. And even thank you as always for your leadership and today and, and, um, and as always, Pat, uh, likewise to you, anything, any update on PPE, capacities, compliance, et cetera? Compliance, Welcome. thanks, Governor. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, with regard to the overnight and compliance, uh, the organizer of yesterday's protest, charges have been authorized against uh, her. Uh, in Newark, uh, 120 individuals were cited for EO violations. In Perth, Amboy, uh, 17 individuals were cited. Uh, they had gathered for the purpose of filming a, a video, and 17 were cited. In Lakewood, uh, one subject was cited, had uh, over 20 people gathering uh, in front of a residence there. Uh, also, in Perth, Amboy, police cited 15 individuals that were patrons of an unlicensed social club. Uh, and if I can just tag on to your comment about the Massachusetts uh, donation, uh, Governor, I did speak with the, uh, the Office of Preparedness and Emergency Management from Massachusetts this morning, Kieran Molesky, uh, and just completely grateful. Uh, I think it's also a good sign that those 50 are coming from the 100 that Hackensack Meridian were returning to our warehouse. So uh, we're going to have them up to Massachusetts within the next few days. And uh, the, as I said, Kieran was wanted to make sure that you, Governor, and the state of New Jersey uh, knew how uh, grateful the state of Massachusetts is. And, and again, the other piece is it's a good sign when we're getting ventilators back from the hospitals that we deliver to them over the next uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, that's all I got, Gov. Amen. And it's a, it's close to home for me because I got a lot of family up there, uh, and they're going through a tough stretch. I've also known their governor for 48 years. He and I both went to high school and college together. He's a great guy. Um, it's important to note, Pat, these are not any of the 500 that we bought. These are ones that, in fact, uh, in, and I want to acknowledge the, the administration, the federal administration, uh, has to bless this. So it, 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 it's a virtual pass from Hackensack Meridian. We, that's a good sign that they're giving them back to us. I hope it stay, I hope we get a lot more back, Judy, sooner than later. Uh, but there's a virtual pass through the federal stockpile uh, on the way up to Massachusetts. We had made that offer, and I want to also thank the, the uh, Trump administration for uh, blessing it. That's correct. And, and just to, and to the same process, the 100 that California gave us a few weeks ago have been disinfected and returned uh, back out to California and or the national stockpile, however that works. So we're going to uh, it hopefully takes on as the national model that we kind of cascade these ventilators and anything else staffing PPE uh, okay. to the areas that need it. And we had promised that we would do this uh uh, in our hour of need, a lot of folks stood up and helped us out when it was the, when it was unspeakably challenging for us. And by the way, folks, please keep doing what you're doing because we could see that again, and I hope we don't. Uh, but we promised that at the right moment when we could responsibly stand up and help others, we would do so. And so I'm honored, Pat. Thank you for leading that. We're going to start, Brendan, over here with Matt, please. Matt, good afternoon. We'll keep these, if you could, to a, to a couple or three. If you sure, could. just three, and, and a quick one right off the bat. Just just with the parks opening up, any is this any sign about what could be expected uh, with beaches uh, in, in the next couple of weeks or after Memorial Day? Governor, uh, we continue to hear from readers who have not yet received unemployment payments, for some for more than a month or more. Uh, I know you have announced uh, steps to increase the output, but are there any additional efforts being made to reduce the backlog? especially considering going a month without any income is a big deal for many people. And Governor, President Trump said yesterday he would support state and local aid if, quote, we'd want certain things also, including sanctuary city adjustments 
And to quote, I'm curious what your reaction is to those comments and if you think it's a fair trade-off. Yeah, I think these are all going to be me, Matt Plack, and Matt, I introduced you in absentia. You're, you're now with us. Um, we'll see how it goes in terms of whether um, opening parks, if, it, if folks do what we're asking them to do, that will, that will have a huge impact on our ability to take other what I call baby steps, and I'm not implying opening parks as a baby step, but, uh, but it will, the hip bone is connected to the thigh bone here. Let's see how the parks go, but no decisions yet or imminently on, um, on beaches, et cetera. And as Matt reminds me, there's only one, te technically one beach that we control, which is Island Beach State Park. Uh, the other beaches is going to, these are going to be guidance that we offer to municipalities. Um, I know that the Labor Department, Department of Labor has chopped through an enormous amount of the backlog, and, and I am enormous sympathy for the folks who are out there who still haven't gotten theirs, and they're frustrated, and their, their accounts are dwindling. I think what I'm going to suggest is Dan to ask you to get Rob Angelo to go directly to Matt and give him a, an exact data point or give it to me for tomorrow's uh, or Friday's briefing um, in terms of giving the exact numbers. They have plussed up, but I don't want to just give you generalities. Um, yeah, I saw what the, pre I, I don't, I, we've got a lot of balls in the air, so I don't literally watch the, the president's um, dailies, but I, I do see clips and or read about it. I saw that he said that you know, I, I don't really have any reaction. I just would say the, the only reaction I still have is we're desperately in need of money uh, and we need, you know, we're still not in the end zone on the interpretation of the CARES Act. I think we've made progress, but we're not there yet. Uh, and that's going to be a fraction of what we need overall. And that's a conversation that I look forward to having with the president, I hope, sooner than later. And uh, I just reiterate, as we have with the congressional leaders, other governors, I mentioned I was on with Governor Hogan um, I lost track yesterday, the day before, who's the chair of the NGA, Republican governor from Maryland. Um, it's not just a Democratic need, it's not just a New Jersey need. And it is literally to pay for the very folks at the front line who we need to keep on the payroll. Uh, and, the, and the alternative here is an ugly one for everybody, for the individuals who would get laid off, uh, for the lack of service that we'd be able to provide. Uh, it would be a mess, unemployment would go up, never mind folks wouldn't be served in their hour of need in the biggest health care crisis in the history of our country, uh, but the unemployment ranks would swell and we can't have any of that. So I look forward to following up with him. We'll get you uh, the, the Department of Labor's specific follow-up. Elise, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mark Pytersky, who oversaw the veterans' homes, is no longer on the job. Did he resign? Was he forced out? Also, with regard to the Paramus Veterans Home, there was swift action on a state investigation in the case of the Andover Home. Does Paramus warrant one as well? Is that it? Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Mark or General Petersky uh, resigned. I've got no, I literally have no more color. Uh, another guy who I've known well, uh, Walter Nall, has now stepped in uh, into that position. I've got literally no more color on that, Elise. Um, the only thing I would say, and, and Judy can come in here behind me, um, the VA is in, in Paramus in a big way, and I was asked this question by John McAlpine the other day, um, is whether it was, uh, uh, whether I could opine as to what the state of play was there in terms of was it being run to the proper standards, et cetera. Uh, and remember, the VA has plussed us up in both Menlo Park and in Paramus, and in the case of Paramus, in addition to plussing us up with medical personnel, they are helping us, in fact, uh, run, run the operation there. I'm looking to make sure Vineland, Vineland, we've seen a slight uptick in numbers here. Judy, I'm not sure you uh, went through the dailies, but we've got uh, uh, five confirmed cases in Vineland, uh, two uh, folks pending and two hospitalized, and thank God at the moment, no deaths. We've got one confirmed case among staff there and three positive, three pending rather. Um, but I would say this, the, the v, part of the reason why the VA is in there, in particular in Paramus, is to be our eyes and ears. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer on, on that just because they're there for a reason. It's not just as they are in Menlo Park to plus up the staffing. It's also to help oversee the management as well as plus up the staffing in Paramus. And you, you'd add to that or you, please? When we called them in, um, we had two conference calls with them. 
uh, to uh, uh, determine exactly what they would be doing and uh, they're uh, uh, assessing leadership, assessing um, the training, uh, particularly the infection prevention, and educating the staff and um, looking at all of their sanitation uh, processes. So it's a complete assessment of not only Paramus but also Menlo Park. Thank you, Judy. Thanks, Elise. Dustin, I think that's you back there, but I can't see you. There you go. Um, I just have a couple, but I also have one from a colleague as well, if you could just give me a little bit of leeway. Um, can you give any updated details on the state's plan to test prison inmates and whether any more have been released? Is the data on deaths and cases at nursing homes now clean, and does it include both staff and residents or just residents? Uh, Governor, do you have any comments on the open letter from a group of education groups, including the NJEA, asking you to keep school schools closed for the rest of the year? And then from my colleague at redbankgreen.com, the Red Bank Regional Board of Education had planned to meet in person tonight, but recently decided to meet virtually. Is that a signal to you that you're concerned about where you might have school boards um, and local governments seeming to defy your executive orders? And what tools do you have in response if that happens? What's the last part of the question? What, what, what tools do you have in, re in response if yeah. that does happen, where, where governments are, are meeting in person? Okay. I, I'll take the last two, and then, uh, Matt, you can, if you don't mind, doing the, the prison uh, inmate uh, release question, and Judy, maybe you can hit testing uh, in prisons as well as data in nursing homes. Nothing new. Um, on the school closings, really, literally nothing to report on that. It's something we're looking at very carefully. We said we they're clo they're virtual until at least May 15, and that we would make an announcement before that date. If the only thing new I would say is my gut tells me, uh, regardless of which way we go, we'll probably beat that uh, meaningfully uh, by at least some number of days in terms of when we make an announcement. So we respect the in the the uh, inputs that we've gotten, but n nothing to report. I wasn't aware of Red Bank Regional. Uh, folks should not be gathering, uh, and we will enforce that. And there's only one set of executive orders that matter, and it's ours. Uh, folks should be meeting virtually. Uh, and again, if we see bad compliance and bad behavior at parks this weekend, just as quickly as we've reopened them, we'll, we'll close them again. And so I don't know whether it was an, an act of defiance. I have no insight into it, but they should not be congregating, period. Folks should not be congregating. Uh, the, the meeting should be done virtually. Matt, any, any, any uh, on the progress of releasing of, uh, of folks from our criminal justice system? Yeah. Um, so we, 54 inmates have been released. There are additional 24 that are scheduled for release. Um, uh, this review is ongoing, so that number uh, will change. Um, with respect to testing uh, at both DOC and JJC facilities, they're rolling out plans in partnership with Rutgers to test inmates. Um, and uh, eventually test staff as well. Um, and Gov, just two uh, additional points that were sent to me from, your, from Matt's questions. The overwhelming majority of unemployment claims that are still outstanding that are old are for the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, which is now up, up and running. Um, so Matt, we can get you more details if, if you need it. And just with respect to beaches, uh, nothing in today's order changes the fact that municipalities can close beaches on their own as they've had the ability to, but obviously, uh, with the commissioner and, and governor, you're, uh, you're reviewing options for uh, the summer months. So. Well put. Judy, any comment uh, on the nursing home data and or any, any other Sure, the, the South Jersey nursing homes that we reviewed, 16% uh, uh, of the residents uh, tested positive, 9% uh, of the staff tested positive. That's with 92% of the results in. We expect... 100% of the results in today, and then we'll be working with all of those nursing homes uh, to make sure that uh, they um, follow all of the guidance that we've put uh, out in the past. Okay. Matt, you answered the, qu the question on testing in, in among uh, corrections, right? Thank you. Thanks, Dustin. Sir, anything? You, you move back. You, you're, you're, you're messing with me here. Keeping you on your toes, guys. Exactly. Uh, You're Governor, the only one. <laughs> Governor, can you explain your abrupt change in parks now being open? Is it based on some new data, a recalculation of the existing risk? Uh, and how will social distancing be enforced in parks? The Restart and Recovery Commission announced yesterday, will the members of that commission be paid? Uh, and where's that money expected to come from? 
And Colonel, uh, finally, could you give us some color what charges were authorized against the organizer of yesterday's protests in Trenton? Pat, I'll start and then ask you to clean it up if that's okay. Um, the, the parks, um, I wouldn't say an abrupt change because the, these are much more, any decisions we take are much more iterative than they appear in public and I can appreciate the fact it feels abrupt because yesterday we said they're closed and today we're saying, as of Saturday morning by the way, uh, that they'll be open. But, but it, is, it is, none of this is abrupt. We are constantly looking at all sides of this. You know, Dustin asked about education and the balance of the school year. That's something we're constantly looking at. We'll have an announcement on one day. Um, and it's, I'd say it's a combination of things. I mentioned this, all the incomings we took didn't, didn't impact me a bit one way or the other, literally not one speck, except for the arguments that Judy has spoken eloquently about. We've had other commissioners. The mental health argument did play into this. But I will say this, if the curves that we show you every day were raging up, uh, we would not be doing what we did today, even notwithstanding that mental health argument. There is some amount of reduction in some of the most important curves that we're looking at, hospitalizations, I think, most importantly. the posit Even though we're not sure what the universe is of folks who have been infected, the positivity rate coming down sort of every single day for the past seven or 10 days of those who have been tested. Remember, uh, by the way, two things. Remember, they're overwhelmingly symptomatic and as Ed Lifshitz reminded me, that's the cumulative number. The number in any given day lately in a particular county is meaningfully lower than that. And, and then thirdly, we're, tr we're, we're basically saying we're prepared to trust you. you, you you're, you've been trusting us and, and we will never forget that. We're, we're returning some amount of that trust by saying, listen, we're gonna open these up, but you gotta behave in a certain way. Uh, and that is you can't congregate, you got to keep your distance, and we, we're not making you, but I'm telling you, I'm strongly recommending you wear face covering. How are we going to enforce it? It's going to th be through a variety of different ways. It'll be state park police. It'll be enforced by the county, uh, clearly at the county level. Pat will have uh, groups as he did in that first weekend in April when it was really good weather and we saw some horrifying results. The parking capacities will be managed locally, as I mentioned, at 50%. And, and I admit you can't bat a thousand, right? You can't go to every corner of every park with somebody on a one-on-one -on -one basis following you around, uh, but we're gonna be pretty pervasive. And again, early week, if we don't like what we see over the weekend, I'm not trying to be a jerk about this. If we literally, if we see congregation of people and they're not social distancing, they're not wearing face masks, we will reconsider. Um, the commission, the members are not paid. Um, so th there's no, no question about where the money's coming from because there is none. Uh, and all I, I, I'm going to turn it to Pat on either the parks or um, what the charges were for yesterday. Again, I, I said the following about yesterday. People have a right to protest. I wish they would do it from home. I don't agree with them on this. Please don't claim that we're not patriotic by flying the American flag implying that we don't fly it. I fly five of them at my house. I love my country, I love my state, we all do, we're trying to save lives. But the thing that really bothered me was they were congregating and they weren't wearing masks for the most part and they were on top of each other and that's what led to the answer Pat's gonna give you. Thank you, Governor. Uh, basically, it's a violation of the executive order that is uh, filed on a complaint summons and vetted through the, uh, in this instance, Mercer County Prosecutor's Office. Thank you. And by the way, we're going to be, and Pat, is it fair to say, uh, again, I wish folks would protest from home and virtually, uh, but if they're going to protest, we're going to be tough on enforcing the, the uh, no congregation. Yeah, to, I mean, to your point, Governor, the executive orders don't prohibit people from uh, exercising their right to protest, but they're very clear on, especially EO 107 and others, about um, the ban on gatherings. Um, and the, the tough part, that with that backdrop in mind, when law enforcement has to you know, 
boots on the ground like we were here yesterday, that, that we need to make decisions on how to engage with those protesters. Uh, we're doing it with both public safety and uh, at the forefront and public health. But I think it's fair to say, I think the troopers showed a tremendous amount of uh, restraint yesterday. Uh, social distancing for those protests that may, I, I put it out there and organizers will be advised ahead of time, the social distancing and face coverings. And if that's not, if that's not in place and we don't witness that, then you will be uh, cited accordingly with a violation of the executive order. Thank you again. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel, good to have you. So um, three questions about the commission. First, um, wondering what you're hoping to hear, you know, what, what, what you're hoping to hear from these members and what you're looking for and what was the logic behind appointing who you did. Um, Second, I'm just a bit curious about why you pointed near attended and from the Center for American Progress and um, Evelyn um, Colbert from Montclair. And um, third, it, it doesn't appear that there's any representative any from the leadership of RWJ, um, Atlantic uh, Health uh, and uh, Hackensack Meridian, and as well as any of the state chambers or local business associations. Um, why is that? What am I looking for from these folks is, is wisdom and, and counsel. We're going through something that none of us have ever gone through before, and we're doing our best. I think we've used an analogy that many have used. We don't see a light switch. We see sort of a, a, a dimmer switch getting turned on gradually, and we need, we need to, as much input and advice, particularly from a variety of perspectives. Um, and... Uh, we, we, I could say definitively, we, we are not close to having all the answers. As great as the team that I'm honored to go to work with every day, we need folks who have, you know, in, in many cases, seen it all, done it all from a different angle. Um, I would just say each of the members of this commission brings something very specific and very, I, I would use the word exceptional to the group, and that includes Nira and, and Evie. And I, I could go through and comment about each and every one of them, but Evie's bias is obviously in the arts, and we want to make sure we're not just America's leading STEM state, but America's continue to be America's leading STEAM state when the dust settles. Uh, and NERA runs one of the most important think tanks uh, in our country uh, and has been explicitly and particularly good uh, herself, not just her organization, at, um, at how to deal with this pandemic and everything from how do you shut down versus how do you reopen. And, and she and her team have been unusually uh, good on this. Uh, we, we, no one turned us down. Um, I'm honored by that. And we could have had a commission that was multiples the size of the one we had. So we had to pick our, our spots and make sure that we had, we felt comfortable with not just the people and we, they're extraordinary. I'm humbled that they're serving, but also that it was a manageable size. And again, to the healthcare systems you, you reference, those are folks we know intimately. We know those systems intimately. Judy deals with them literally every day. I deal with their leadership most days. Um, they're there, they're already, they're part of us. Uh, someone asked me yesterday about Choose New Jersey. It's another good example of that. We know that they're there. We've been relying on them. Uh, they've done extraordinary, the healthcare systems have done a, almost universally an extraordinary job and we, we're gonna need them to continue to help us as we rebuild this thing. There is a big economic element to this as well. So there is clearly, of the six uh, mileposts, four of them are heavy healthcare, get the curves down, testing protocols, contact tracing protocols, isolation protocols. Um, we think we, we, we are getting our arms around what we need to do with those four we need a lot of help with, okay, now you get that in place, what does it look like then? Not just your economic recovery, but your resiliency. How are you gonna deal with these, as by example, the lack of capacities that we had, or these racial and social inequities that we're discussing literally almost every day. So thank you for that. Dave, you get to send us out today. Okay, a uh, couple of questions. First one on antibody testing, it's being ramped up dramatically in many parts of the country, including New York where they now estimate 25% about of all of the people tested in New York City have COVID-19 antibodies. 
Uh, LabCorp announced yesterday that they're offering this testing uh, along with Quest. I got an email yesterday from LabCorp. Um, what can antibody testing do or not do for New Jersey? I know we've talked about it's only a point in time snapshot and it doesn't necessarily follow with contact tracing, but is there a value in getting a better sense of how many people in New Jersey actually have been exposed to COVID-19 in our state? And the second question, as you have uh, been talking about, and we discussed yesterday, Governor, you know, you were called a fascist for closing part of the state. Um, one state senator has been referring to you as King Murphy, although you don't have your own sound music uh, wherever you go, so that might be questionable. Um, but this whole issue with the parks and golf courses, um, you know, does this send a signal that you're not acting irrationally, do you think? I mean, I understand you're saying it's, it's not from the pushback that you got, but I mean, what's important for Jersey residents to keep in mind in terms of the way you're looking at making decisions? Um, is this a situation where your decision-making process is based on reasonableness, do you think? Uh, is it based on science and fact? Um, instead of you just trying to usurp power? Or what do you want people in our state to know about this? Um, thank you for both of those questions. Uh, I, I, I suspect that the right person to hand your first question to with one brief comment would be Christina, um, as she, in fact, is the epidemiologist. But you, you make a, a very good, just uh, I'll make two points. Number one, we've got an army at the Rock right now working literally morning, noon, and night on testing of all shapes and sizes, uh, including antibody. Um, and we wanna make sure that we spend our bullets appropriately. Uh, and Matt and I were discussing this earlier. There is this, and I think for folks out there who may not have a, a good sense of it, uh, in a non-medical sense, I'll put, you've got, uh, you've got sort of two options here, the, the snapshot of a moment in time versus the watching the movie and seeing your life play out and, and that's sort of the difference of the regimes here. I suspect we're gonna firmly come down and we need both. Uh, and we need them for both for different reasons. Um, but Christina will, will, um, will clean this up. Before I, uh, I, again, the incomings, I don't, I don't even literally, I don't even listen. I think if you don't have a thick skin, you're probably in the wrong seat given the one that I'm in. Uh, but it, it literally is irrelevant to me. We, we are, I, I do want folks to, re, re, remi, I want to remind folks rather that we overwhelmingly make decisions based on, on fact and science and data, period. Um, and some of that is hard, fast numbers, the curves that we're watching. Uh, again, notwithstanding what is a softer but very important argument uh, that Judy has been making, other commissioners have been making, we all have as it relates to mental health and the impact on that, uh, which is harder to put on a curve, uh, but we are in incredibly and deeply sympathetic to that argument, more than anecdotally, but certainly anecdotally, but more than that. Uh, we're also looking at hard numbers, so notwithstanding the fact we may be sympathetic to the mental health challenges, whether they be you know, all the things we've talked about, Depression. You've been listening to live press conference from New Jersey. Governor Phil Murphy there. He did make the announcement at the top of this hour. He will be reopening beaches and parks starting this Saturday. We're going to take a short break. Much more news ahead at the top of the hour. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS at. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. 
you would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay 1800 in five days or you have to leave. Were you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Times of uncertainty. Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this, we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers. Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Nina Nine, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm coming to you from my home studio here. I want to thank you again for joining us. The United States has not yet, has now actually crossed into yet another grim milestone just a day after passing the mark of 1 million coronavirus cases nationwide. In less than three months, COVID-19 has killed more than 58,000 people. That's more than the number of Americans who died over nearly two decades of fighting in the Vietnam War. At least nine states have already begun reopening non-essential businesses to the public. Another 10 have stay-at-home orders expiring tomorrow. Manuel Bajorquez reports from one of them, Florida, which is planning to reopen after seeing its highest single death toll yesterday. Until I feel by following the science that we are ready to open, we will not open. Mitch Kaplan's books may be collecting dust, but the owner of seven community bookstores in Florida says he's not quite ready to let customers back in. The stakes are high, and if you are going to reopen, you better pay attention and know what the consequences are. Which could be what, in your view? An employee gets sick. Could be that a customer gets sick. It could be that you have to turn around and close down once again. Florida is among the latest states to announce it's lifting parts of its lockdown. Effective May 1st, restaurants, fitness centers, retail stores, and enclosed malls may um, reopen at 50% of normal operating capacity. Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds announced businesses in 77 of Iowa's 99 counties could operate with limits, despite the statewide number of confirmed cases increasing by around 75% in a week. In New York Tuesday, Governor 